Next, a House subcommittee looks at what factors the federal government considers when purchasing counterterrorism technology. And the U.S. Senate returns at 9.15 a.m. Eastern. Senators will begin the day with a couple of votes on judicial nominees. Later, they'll continue debate on spending for the District of Columbia. The Subcommittee on National Security, Emerging Threats and International Relations, entitled Counterterrorism Technology, Picking Winners and Losers, is called to order. The emergence of terrorism as a threat to domestic security laid bare our myriad vulnerabilities, but also unleashed a tidal wave of national scientific ingenuity and creativity. Well before September 11th, government, businesses, and individuals pursued development of new technologies to strengthen homeland defenses. Research labs, defense contractors, members of Congress, and others have been inundated with proposals for everything from satellite monitoring cargo containers to individual radiation detectors. What happens to all those ideas? Who is responsible for sorting through that mountain of paper, sifting wheat from chaff, and making sure only the best concepts move forward to prototype and the marketplace? In the past, we found duplication and a lack of coordination in federal counterterrorism research and development programs. Testimony before this subcommittee in March 2000 described overlapping unfocused chemical and biological defense research programs in the Department of Defense, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, Department of Energy Labs, and the Department of Justice. We also heard about an established interagency forum for evaluation and rapid prototyping of counterterrorism technologies called the Technical Support Working Group, referred to as TSWG. Now, to that already crowded field, add to the, add the Department of Homeland Security, DHS, which Congress charged to act as both a developer and clearinghouse for innovative technologies. Today, we focus on the TSWG process, their performance, or its performance, and its potential role with DHS in channeling the torrent of homeland security technologies into a coherent stream. In terms of process, the working group relies on broad area announcements to sweep the technological horizon for proposals. Subgroups of interested agency representatives and experts use streamlined formats to speed evaluation of the responses. Projects meeting specific requirements have been nurtured and brought quickly to production. In the near term, DHS will use the technical support working group process to develop a, a substantial volume of annual funding for prototype technologies. But DHS officials concede they are establishing similar and overlapping capabilities within their organization. So we ask TSWG participants both government agencies and private sector innovators to assess the past and potential of the working group in establishing and implementing government-wide priorities for homeland security technologies. We thank all our witnesses for their time, expertise, and we look forward to their testimony. This time, let me just uh, recognize our first panel, and then I'll swear them in. We have Mr. Michael, Michael Jacob, Director of Technical Programs, Office of the Coordinator for Counterterrorism, Department of State. We have Mr. Edward McAllum, Director, Combating Terrorism Technology Support Office, Department of Defense. We also have Mr. David Bolka, Director of HSARPA, which is? Homeland Security Advanced Research Project Home, Agency. Homeland Security Advanced Research Project Agency, right below. It's doctor, I'm sorry. Uh, from the Department of Homeland Security. This time, gentlemen, if you would stand, we'll swear you in, and then we'll proceed. Uh, if there's anyone else that you may want to testify or respond to question, raising your right hand, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you.
We'll start with you, uh, Mr. Jacob. Thank you very much. And uh, what we're going to do um, is allow you to speak five minutes and then roll over another five. I would prefer you not take ten, but I don't want you to feel rushed in your five minutes. And you'll need these mics you need to put pretty close to you, and you also need to make sure they're on. That's not close enough. I'm sorry. You're going to have to move her right in f Yeah, there we go. And that, it's not on, I don't think. I've, ne I've never noticed. Is there okay. a light that turns on when it, yeah? It just turned on. Okay, here we go. And turn the mic a little more towards you, if you would. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to testify today on the National Combating Terrorism Research and Development Program, <clears throat> which is carried out by the Interagency Technical Support Working Group. As you know, I'm accompanied today by Mr. Edward McCallum from the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Special Ops and Low Intensity Conflict, and in the future, I'll just say SOLIC so everybody knows what we're talking about, and by Mr. David Bolka from the Department of Homeland Security. <coughs> uh, before I start, uh, Ambassador Black, the coordinator for counterterrorism at State Department, sends his regards to you and to other members of the subcommittee. He notes that he wanted to be here today, but he has a schedule conflict and he's currently traveling overseas. I'm told that you're a, a better replacement, is that right? <laughs> I'll put that, uh, my boss is here, so we'll have to put that into the, okay. <laughs> the OER. Uh, with I your told permission. you know what you're talking about. <laughs> With your permission, we wanted to submit a uh, slightly revised statement for the record. Um, I'm going to be talking to you today and trying to put the TSWG into a broad perspective for you. The other presentations, I think, will narrow it down a little further, but by approaching it in this manner, uh, you're going to get a feel for the entire program. The hearings come at a, a really good time. Um, they come at a time of daily reminders of the terrorist threat, and I don't want to go into a lot about the terrorist threat, but we need to put this into a little bit of perspective because you're going to hear us in TSWG talk about a threat-driven requirements-based program, and everything we do derives from the nature of the threat that we are facing today as a country. Just a couple of points I want to make. Uh, the terrorist threat is spreading geographically. There is no geographic area that is immune from this type of threat. 9-11, the events of 9-11 brought the threat home to the continental United States. Bali, which occurred last October, demonstrates that no area, no matter how idyllic, is immune from the threat of international terrorism. Secondly, terrorist capabilities, and especially their technical capabilities, are growing and increasing. Terrorists have demonstrated they can acquire sophisticated weapons like the SA-7 that they uh, attempted to use last year in Mombasa. They get these either from state sponsors or on the black market, and they also get training from various state sponsors. Terrorists are also sharing information on technical expertise, for example, specifically in areas of improvised explosive devices, explosive mixtures, mixtures detonating systems, and the like. Information from the cookbooks and the computer files that were seized in Afghanistan are, as we have found out, in the hands of other terrorist groups. There's also a preoccupation by some terrorist groups today with chemical, biological, radiological materials and toxic industrial chemicals. The arrests in the United Kingdom and France earlier this year and in Italy last year uh, demonstrate this current preoccupation. Thankfully, those attacks were thwarted before any real damage could have been carried out, but they are a possible harbinger of things to come and are things that those of us working in technology development have to keep uppermost in our mind. We need to be prepared for the evolving nature of the terrorist threat. In terms of the U.S. response, Mr. Chairman, the U.S. and its allies have been working hard to prevent terrorist attacks through a variety of means. We highlight a number of those in the written statement. The one I want to focus on today, though, is our effort to rapidly develop and apply technology to meet the challenges posed by terrorists. Specifically, our challenge is to provide a coherent and consistent context for technology development based on the threat, technical innovation, real operator needs, and proven procedures and tactics. Simply put, the TSWG philosophy is to try to get ahead of the curve. We want to try and anticipate future weapons and tactics that may be used by terrorists, and to develop good countermeasures to defeat terrorist capabilities and at the same time enhance the counterterrorism capabilities of the United States and its allies. 
We've provided in the written statement a pretty detailed description of how the TSWG program came to be and its funding sources. I don't want to review that in detail here with you, but I do want to make a couple of points. Uh, Counterterrorism R&D was one of the key issues addressed in 1986 in the Vice President's Task Force Report on Combating Terrorism that was chaired by then Vice President Bush. The task force recommended the formation of an interdepartmental mechanism to coordinate national level R&D program aimed at filling the gaps in existing R&D and trying to prevent duplication of efforts. State and specifically my office was assigned responsibility for developing and coordinating this effort and to accomplish that task we formed a TSWG which has existed since that time. Initial funding for TSWG was centered in the state budget. However, by the early 1990s, it came to be recognized in Congress, within the administration, within all the departments at that time, that if that funding and if that program was going to grow, it was going to have to have funding contributions from a lot of other agencies beside the department. In response, the DOD acknowledged the importance of the program and formally established a dedicated funding line beginning in FY92 to support the TSWG and the national program. From that date until today, both state and defense annually contribute what we call core funding for the program, with DOD providing the lion's share of those core funds. Other departments and agencies, however, also contribute funds based on their interests, their needs, and the degree to which our national program is addressing their specific requirements. Our current organization for TSWG is relatively simple and straightforward. It demonstrates both the TSWG's interdepartmental approach and our focus on developing technology in those critical functional areas necessary to have a well-rounded counterterrorism program. You should have an attachment with our statement up there which gives you a line of block chart on how we're put together. You might want to refer to that just for a second. TSWG is a jointly administered effort with defense. My office, the Office of the Coordinator for Counterterrorism, provides policy oversight and overall program direction through our chairmanship of I'm the TSWG. I'm just going to ask you to suspend. You, you want us to refer to, uh, to what I There think should be an know. attachment there, sir, which gives you a line of, yes, sir, that's okay. it. Is that, do we have that on there? Yes, it's in the next. Okay. Okay, thank okay. you. Okay. Uh, if you take a look at that, you'll see that the program is a jointly administered effort with defense. My office, the Office of the Coordinator for Counterterrorism, provides policy oversight and overall program direction through our chairmanship of the TSWG's executive committee. We also contribute core funds to the program. ASD SOLIC provides technical oversight, executes and administers the program on a daily basis through what is called the Combating Terrorism Technology Support Office and also contributes the lion's sh share of core funding for the program. If you refer to all the blocks across the bottom of the chart, those are our functional subgroups. Ten federal departments and a number of federal agencies representing over 80 elements of the federal government participate in those functional sub-working groups. This is where requirements are generated and proposals are evaluated. Mr. McCallum is going to explain this in a lot more detail in a few minutes. In addition to federal elements, we have extended membership invitations to selected state and local organizations and to some congressional elements as well. For example, the Capitol Police, uh, the Sar Senate Sergeant at Arms, and the Office of the Architect of the Capitol also participate on several of the TSWG sub-working groups. We like to hear the requirements from the Hill as well as those from federal departments. Most recently, we reached agreement with the new Department of Homeland Security to join the TSWG. As a result, the TSWG will implement, with the support of DHS, those rapid prototyping and development technology requirements of interest to that department, many of which are also of interest to other departments and other agencies as well. DHS has also agreed to contribute funding to the TSWG to assist in the program. Our program focuses on advanced technology development activities to meet the near-term counterterrorism and anti-terrorism technology and equipment needs of the federal community. Specifically, we support U.S. diplomatic, intelligence, security, law enforcement, the military, and the first responder communities. I won't go into examples of all the successes that we have had, but if you remember the threat I talked a bit about just at the beginning of this presentation, we mentioned terrorist interest in CBR materials. Two of our more, more recent projects uh, have been the uh, uh, escape masks, 
which uh, have also been issued to members of Congress and are being bought right now by other departments. And more recently, uh, we have produced and are disseminating now a low-cost dosimeter badge designed to give the wearer an immediate indication of exposure to a radiological source. Now, those are just two examples describing how our program is contributing to the global war on terrorism. There are many others which, because of time and in some cases classification, I can't discuss in an open forum. You should be aware, however, that some of the equipment that's being used today by our military forces and intelligence elements in Afghanistan and Iraq, as well as equipment being utilized right now to provide anti-terrorism force protection for our embassies and for our military bases, both at home and abroad, were developed by the TSWG program. And we can provide you more examples, as you may be interested in. One other aspect of our program is that we also have developed cooperative R&D agreements with three selected NATO and major non-NATO allies. This is done to assist in helping us accomplish our objectives. Thus, we can leverage our own funding. These working arrangements are with Canada, Israel, and the United, and the United Kingdom. Successfully completed projects result in equipment that we both both us and our partners have jointly developed and are employing. And in a written statement, I give you some examples. I don't want to dwell on them here. There are a lot of others as well. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, we believe the TSWG program is a valuable arrow in the national quiver for countering the evolving terrorism threat. We'd like to expand the program by adding a few new foreign partners who have demonstrated R&D capabilities in counterterrorism technologies, share our views on the threat, have an appropriate interagency focus in their technical development activities and are willing to pay their fair share in joint technology development. When combined with other R&D programs for combating terrorism, for example, those that are going to be developed in the Department of Homeland Security, as well as existing ones in DOD, the intel community, the FBI, and other agencies, we believe we're making real progress in addressing the technical nature of the terrorist threat. Those of us who work in the TSWG program are very proud of its accomplishments. Our guiding goal here is to put enhanced and usable technical capability into the hands of those involved on a daily basis in conducting the global war on terrorism, and we believe we're achieving that goal. We believe our ability to be successful is derived from our current business practices, which are based on a requirements-driven process featuring extensive information exchange with both the user and developer communities. We're also mindful and thankful for the dedication and hard work of all the men and women who are part of the TSWG family. Much. Mr. McCollum. Dr. McCollum, excuse me. Mr. That's Dr. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm Edward McCallum, director of the DOD Combating Terrorism Technology Support Office the office that manages the uh, affairs of the Technical Support Working Group, which I'll call the TISWIG from now on, as most other people do, and the uh, Military Explosive Ordnance Disposal Low Intensity Conflict Program. Uh, Mr. Jacob has uh, artfully described the history and heritage of the uh, TISWIG, so my uh, oral testimony will emphasize uh, the organization, some of the business processes that he spoke of, and a few selected uh, successes. Um, we have, a, 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 uh, for your display, an easel board with some charts. Now, there are eye charts for all of us um, and, and for you, too, but we will refer to uh, some pages in the written testimony that also include those, um, those charts. Um, as Mr. Jacobs stated, our mission is to conduct the National Interagency Research and Development Program for Combating Terrorism. Me, Mr. McCallum, uh, it, this chart is also available for us. Is it in the... It, it, uh, I'll get to the chart in just a moment, but that chart is displayed on page three of the written testimony. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, the TSWG carries out its mission by providing technologies to support both armed forces overseas who are bringing the fight to the enemy and uh, first responders at home. TSWG developed technologies are not proprietary to a single or particular user base, but frequently have applications to warfighters and first responders. Our technologies are being used for offensive warfighting operations and for defensive measures at home. Sensors and detectors assist in preventing incidents, while other technologies help mitigate the consequences of these actions or attribute culpability for incidents when they occur. 
Uh, the organization of the Tisk WIG includes representatives from over 80 federal organizations. And although the, uh, the, the eye chart is difficult to read, it, it, it really shows the expanse of participants. And that's displayed on page three of the written testimony for your review. Um, it, it crosses the, the, the depth and width of the federal government from agriculture to defense to all of the other homeland security elements, that, uh, including DHS. Um, departments and agencies, including representatives from our first responder end user communities, such as firemen, policemen, hazmat, bomb squads, uh, participate in nine of these subgroups. The organization is displayed um, in the second easel chart and also on page two of, your, of the testimony. It's the um, same organization that Mr. Jacob displayed before you, but I wanted to go for just a moment across the bottom. He described the uh, management oversight process, but if you take a look at the uh, charts, you see a broad um, <coughs> representation of federal agencies who chair these subgroups. Below those single letter agencies rep are represented about 300 individual uh, operators, uh, scientists and engineers from across the federal government and our first responder community who come to the table uh, to describe their requirements and to help us shepherd them through the, the, um, the entire procurement process. We believe we operate under a highly successful integrated business model. Um, and we'll display it in yet an, a third easel chart, which is available on page four. And I'll speak for just a moment to that chart. As Mr. Jacob mentioned, we start the year in January with a threat day where members of the intelligence and law enforcement community come before our 300, rough, approximately 300 members and describe to them what the threat situation is in real day terms and um, vet not only the, the, the threat, but they help us define and prioritize requirements for the uh, upcoming year. The requirements definition and prioritization by ultimate users assures that R&D products produced by TSWG's rapid prototyping program will ultimately enter the marketplace or military acquisition process. It's followed just before the 12 o'clock and on, where you see BAA for broad agency announcement by an uh, um, advanced annual program briefing to industry where we brief prospective vendors on our requirements and invite their, invite their industry comments and clarification. Uh, this process helps assure that what we get from industry uh, meets our specific posted requirements. TSWG utilizes a three-step process for managing this process as depicted on the right-hand side of the chart. Um, we first ask for a one-page quad chart from industry. Uh, we, man we ask for that in order to minimize their expense and to maximize our ability to review their proposals and get them out to the community. Um, we recognize that the preparation of good proposals requires a substantial amount of time and money from industry. And it manages the selection process through the stages of quad charts, white papers, and final proposals. The uh, success rate for final proposals is certain, is is always above 80 percent, and sometimes it gets up to to 90 percent. The entire process of posting requirements and informing proposals on how to how to apply, and the evaluation is done electronically through a broad agency and an electronic commerce system, which we call the bids, which is the broad agency information delivery system, and it's available on our website at www.tswg.gov. The process is aimed at putting prototypes in the hands of users within approximately 24 months. A few years ago, we used to talk 18 months. The process has, has gotten a little larger and slightly more involved. In the last year, we sometimes have given products to our users, particularly in the military front, within days. Um, but uh, much of the low-hanging fruit has been picked in this, in this endeavor. Um, in the written testimony, we've given you a dozen or so successes which are, which are in the hands of users uh, and which we've delivered in the last year or so. Uh, in addition to that, I just wanted to bring one hard piece here. We've been attempting to develop technology which is handheld so that first responders, whether they're hazmat teams or military units, can 
have it in their in their pockets or, or their rucksacks and carry it usefully. One of our providers this year developed for us a heat stress calculator, which has been very popular both in the military community and within the Justice Department for, for, for uh, first responders. We've all read and some of us have experienced how uncomfortable full chemical outfits can be, particularly uh, under, under any kind of heat stress. Um, and in fact, in Southeast Asia, I lost more troops to heat, str to heat stress than I did to either disease or enemy fire. Uh, this calculator within about one minute can tell you what a person in any of these conditions and various heat and various humidity conditions and, and workload, how, you know, how long they can normally endure and is being looked at uh, by firemen and military uh, uh, users with a lot of anticipation. This is fresh out of the barrel. Um, and one that I did want to bring to your attention, and we have copies here for you, is a best practices and guidelines for mass personnel decontamination. Um, a few years ago when the Benai Brith was uh, threatened <coughs> here in Washington, D.C., and we saw scenes of uh, civilians being uh, run between some a couple of uh, fire department uh, hose trucks, uh, it occurred to us that the procedures that had been developed for military people wouldn't necessarily fit for this, you know, Capitol building or people around the, around the world. So we set out to develop the best practices and guidelines. It encompasses not just um, science and evidence-based practices, but also best, pra uh, best uh, pra business practices and science practices. Uh, it was developed by the U.S., the U.K., and Canada. In closing, I'd like to uh, cite what I believe to be distinctive about our technical support working group accomplishments. They represent real problems to real solutions encountered by key participants in the war on terrorism. They represent and meet real requirements of the war as defined by end users. And their transition to general use is assured by the fact that end users have been part of the TSWG process from inception to ultimate product consumption. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Dr. Bolka. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. Dr. Subcommittee could I staff. have you just move that mic a little closer to you? A little could closer? You? Yeah, it helps. Is that better? Much better. Thank you. Uh, I'm Dr. David Bolka, Director of the Homeland Security Advanced Research Projects Agency, or HSARPA. Uh, we wish we had a better acronym, but uh, we don't. <laughs> I'm pleased to uh, appear before you this afternoon to discuss our relationship with the Technical Support Working Group, or TISWIC. Uh, in your letter, you asked several questions about this relationship. I trust that my testimony in com combination with that of Mr. McCollum and Mr. Jacob addresses all of them. As you know, HSARPA was created by the Homeland Security Act of 2002. The responsibilities of the director are specified in that act, paraphrasing in the area of research and development. Uh, we support both basic and applied homeland security research to promote revolutionary changes. That's about 10 to 15 percent of our budget uh, in the technologies to promote homeland security. Uh, we advance the development, testing, and evaluation and deployment of critical technologies. And also we have a prototyping, uh, rapid prototyping mission, and that's uh, the third part of our mission. Uh, this is the one area where our mission and that of the TISWIG overlap the most. Uh, many of our DHS user agencies have worked with TISWIG in the past and continue to do so. Uh, Mr. McCollum has described some of the technology that TISWIG has brought forward for them. I don't see this overlap in rapid prototyping responsibilities as either debilitating or wasteful. There is sufficient work for all of us uh, to develop these technologies. As Mr. McCollum described, in 2003, while HSARPA was being organized and hiring staff, uh, we provided funds for a combined DHS-TISWIG broad area announcement that was issued on May 14, 2003. Uh, this BAA listed 51 top priority research and technology needs that we share with TISWIC. DHF staff members have participated in working groups with TISWIC and have helped evaluate many of the quad charts and white papers that were submitted in response. 
Uh, we'll also participate in evaluating the proposals that result from this solicitation, and our requirements were incorporated in the solicitation. Uh, we're represented currently on the Executive Committee by my Deputy Director, Dr. Jane Alexander, and in several working groups by S&T staff members and other DHS members. Uh, last Tuesday, HSARPA issued its first research announcement for detection systems for biological and chemical countermeasures. This announcement begins our work on the next generation of biological and chemical sensors and systems. The research announcement solicits white papers leading to proposals from industry, academia, and laboratories in five technical topic areas, two biological and three chemical. We are using TISWIG's established bids system to publish the research announcement, to electronically register those who respond, to collect their white papers, and to distribute them to technical reviewers. Uh, this morning, we held a bidders conference here in Washington to provide detailed information to potential bidders. Uh, there were somewhat over 300 people who attended that bidders conference. In HSARPA, we have an approved staffing plan that will see us staffed to about 50 percent of authorized scientific and technical headcount early in 2004, reaching nearly 100 percent by late summer. We receive legal, security, facilities, and administrative support from our DHS Management Directorate. Our first contracting officer and attorney have been assigned. Also, I have seven technical scientific professionals on board at this point. As HSARPA develops its own capability to solicit the country's best technical ideas, concepts, technologies, and systems, we'll rely less on the TISWIG infrastructure and more on our own. It's worth noting that our development involves not only creating the ability to solicit and evaluate, but the simultaneous capability to execute high-quality research and development programs as we proceed. For fiscal year 2004, uh, just under 25 percent of the HSARPA budget will be expended in rapid prototyping. We expect that TISWIG will perform this function for us in the near term with our participation. In his statement before the House Appropriations Subcommittee on Homeland Security last April 10th, DHS Undersecretary for Science and Technology, Dr. Charles McQuarrie, said that the Science and Technology Directorate would establish a partnership with the Technical Support Working Group. We have done that. To implement that partnership, DHS requested $30 million in fiscal year 04 to solicit near-term capabilities that can be rapidly prototyped and fielded. The Congress has increased this funding to $75 million in the fiscal 04 appropriation. That's why the percentage of our budget for private prototyping has gone from roughly 10 percent to about 25 percent. As HSARPA matures and the Systems Engineering Development Branch of the S&T Directorate st staffs up, we will assume the majority of rapid prototyping responsibility and will coordinate it internally with our S&T developments. We will continue to fund TISWIG to perform rapid prototyping work when it is mutually beneficial. Over the next few months, we will continue to refine and will document our working relationships with the TISWIG. Our intent is to fulfill the clear intent of the establishing legislation and to execute the full scope of HSARPA functions as rapidly as staff and facilities can be assembled. We believe that TISWIG experience and facilities can help us achieve that goal in the near term. And under any foreseeable circumstances, we will retain our position on the TISWIG Executive Board to collaborate, share information, join in mutually interesting developments, avoid unnecessary development duplication, and derive mutual benefit from our continuing association. Subject to any questions you may have, Mr. Chairman, that concludes my testimony. Thank you. Thank you very much. My, um, <clears throat> in making reference to the Technical Support Working Group, uh, I refer to it as TSWG, and my staff director said it's TISWIG, and I said no grown man would say those words. <laughs> and uh, now you make me feel very comfortable. I'll be the fourth to do it. That's uh, what we've been referring to it as for the last 10 years? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, 
Let me just take care of some business first and recognize Mr. Tierney is here and thank him very much. It gives me the opportunity to ask unanimous consent that all members of the subcommittee be permitted to place an opening statement in the record and the record remain open for three days for that purpose without objection so order. I ask for the unanimous consent that all witnesses be, be permitted to include their written statements in the record and without objection so ordered. Um, I'd like to start out and, and with Dr. Bolka and just have me um, be comfortable with uh, what we've done with the Department of Homeland Security. We basically established a department with 185,000 plus folks. Uh, this was the committee that had the responsibility for reorganization and um, I was very um, comfortable in supporting that. It, it had uh, basically four legs to this operation. It had the Undersecretary of Science and Technology, Undersecretary of Information Analysis and Infrastructure Protection, and then another Undersecretary for Border and Transportation Security. And finally, uh, the Undersecretary of Emergency Preparedness and Response. And I feel like these table, these legs are uh, uh, much different sizes here. Um, obviously, the border uh, and transportation security is a pretty huge part of D DHS. How many employees work under the entire secretary, uh, the directorate of information analysis and infrastructure protection? Excuse me, under science and technology, I'm sorry. I, I don't know, Mr. Chairman, but I will find out in return. And How many work answer. under your particular part of that? Uh, in science and technology, we have an authorization of 180 end strength. Okay. Under science and technology total. Yes. Yeah, that's what I meant. But oh. now under HS, uh, your particular area. Uh, in HS ARPA, I have uh, a staffing plan which will get me to approximately 135 uh, staff, 62 of which are government, and the rest would be support contractors. And that's out of a total amount within this directorate of how many? About 180 government right. employees. I'd have about a third of them. Now, um, Going to you, Mr. Jacob um, and Mr. McCollum, I am, um, in trying to think about the hearing we had way back in March of 2000, uh, and, and putting in perspective today, since obviously a lot's happened since then with September 11th, um, I'm not, I don't quite have a grasp of, uh, uh, Tiswig is basically uh, in the Department of Defense, but it is, it is under the jurisdiction of the Department of State. <clears throat> TSWG, as I mentioned. Uh, <laughs> Trying to confuse me? <laughs> <laughs> Tiswood. Uh, as I mentioned uh, during the testimony, there came as a result of that finding that was in the uh, Vice President's Task Force report. The Department of State was asked to take on that job. And that's and in did. 1980, uh, 1989? 1986. 86. Yes, sir. We exercise uh, program direction and policy oversight over the program. It's executed by the Department of Defense. And so it is a joint state defense effort. And that was done deliberately so that we wouldn't have to create another extra bureaucracy within State Department to handle this. Uh, and that's how it, it came about. So is it funded out of DOD? It's funded by both. Both of us contribute money to what we call core funding. And um, your, uh, uh, then who, who ultimately is in charge? I, I'm not clear as to my knowledge of who ultimately is in charge. Yes, who ultimately is in charge for program direction and overall policy oversight of the program is my boss, Ambassador Black, the coordinator for right. counterterrorism. Mr. O'Connell, who is the assistant secretary for special ops and low intensity conflict, is in charge for program execution. Okay. And um, if there's a disagreement between the two, who trumps who? We haven't ever gotten to that point, to be very honest with you. Uh, it's been run from day one, and we have never run into that problem. When I look at the number of folks involved, um, I had this sense that Department of Homeland Security was going to be basically the one that evaluated any um, proposals that would Im impact the Department of Homeland Security. 
but I'm obviously wrong, so Dr. Balka, tell me how it works. My understanding, Mr. Chairman, is, and my experience in the previous BAA is that members of Homeland Security user groups and, in my case, members, uh, technical members of my staff, participate in the evaluation of the quad charts, the white papers, and the proposals. They also meet, uh, as you saw on Mr. McCollum's chart, uh, to set requirements. And so our requirements are incorporated with the other requirements to ensure that they're all addressed and there is no duplication. Then once the program is being executed, the results are reported to all those who are participating. So basically the pro proposals go to Tiswick. They don't go to you. If that's the mechanism that we set out, that's correct. In the case of I, the I don't understand if. In okay. other words, it hasn't been decided? No. In the case of the BIA that we let last summer, the proposals did go to Tiswick. We sent the money to Tiswick, and Tiswick is, will be executing the programs that result from the proposals. In the case of our recent research announcement, which we held the bidders conference for today, we are using the Tiswick infrastructure to publish to collect the white papers and to assign for evaluation uh, those that come in prior to selecting them. In this case, my pro program managers will be running the programs that result from this. There will be full visibility uh, for all of the members of TISWIG as to what we are doing, so there will be no little duplication if possible. Maybe I'll understand it better this way. Okay. Why didn't we put Tiswig under the Department of Homeland Security? Maybe Mr. Jacob, Mr. McCallum, you could tell me why we didn't. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Um, as I mentioned in my brief testimony, um, a subset of what we do in combating terrorism is involved in homeland defense and the defense of items and facilities and personnel within the domestic United States. Another large part of what we do is in support of the offensive war on terrorism overseas in support of State Department and the intelligence community and the Department of Defense. Um, the technologies that, we, that you see, you'll see to, and to talk about in a few moments, like the uh, chem bio suits in front of you, can equally be used by soldiers on the battlefield or hazmat teams in St. Louis. The robots that you'll see demonstrated are used by military explosive ordnance disposal teams to address the improvised explosive device, devices we're seeing in the Middle East or by teams in, uh, here at your own Capitol Police use uh, systems that we've developed. The technology isn't specific to a pipe, uh, to a stovepipe of users or, or a, uh, uh, an item of turf. We, we develop technologies for all users and within our subgroups they're all represented and they take the parts that they need to, to uh, fulfill their missions back to their uh, home organizations, whether it's the Department of Defense, the Department of State, or the Department of Homeland Security. Now, you have nine subgroups, correct? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, how, many, um, how many people, I'm trying to visualize, and they come from all these various departments. Maybe I need to be, to be clear. How many do you have on your staff under TISWIG? I have approximately 70 people today, sir. And is that uh, a full complement? Uh, that's a full complement. That's approximately um, 20 program managers, scientists, engineers, and operators, approximately 20 contracting and security uh, support people from DOD, and the rest uh, are support contract people from specific uh, technical uh, organizations that we need to support. Mr. Uh, Jacob, how many people do you have in yours? Uh, two. Now, do you work out of the State Department? Yes, or, sir. Uh, in the office department. We're at the Pentagon, Mr. McCollum? Yes, sir. Right. And when you have your meetings, uh, your meeting, I'm trying to visualize. I understand and I appreciate that, that obviously, uh, the, the research that's going to happen is going to impact both foreign and domestic. It can impact the military. It can impact so many different uh, folks that, uh, obviously, in that way, I can see why it wouldn't be under the Department of Homeland Security. But I'm, I'm just having a, a, a little bit difficult time uh, trying to visualize how it works in practice. Uh, do people go to the Pentagon? Do you have periodic meetings with each of these nine subgroups? To, just walk me through that a little bit. Actually, our, our offices are in 
Crystal Gateway North, just across the parking lot from the right. Pentagon. Okay. Uh, and we have um, a series of offices and conferences. Does that make rooms. it easier? Excuse me to interrupt, but does that make it easier for people to access you? It's much but, easier to get yeah. into our office than it is right. in the Pentagon. So. Okay. Um, it's right off the metro. Uh, we, we host a number of meetings. As I said, we have requirements meetings during the year when all of the subgroup members, and there are approximately 300 members, but if I just talk our, our, our chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear countermeasures subgroup, the last subgroup meeting I sat in on had approximately 40 people from across the government contributing to the requirements process and uh, voting uh, up or down on different proposals. Um, these, the discussion is on a technical basis. It's on also, it, we also look at how many agencies these technologies will benefit. If there's a single agency it's going to benefit, we usually ask them to fund it out of their core budgets. If it's multiple agencies, because we have an interagency role, you know, it moves up the line. So we, we, uh, we talk to funding organizations and uh, make sure that the highest priorities in R&D are accomplished. Well, let me, how do you guarantee or, or feel comfortable about the different departments that, that come with their own perspective that ultimately uh, in this process of deciding, is, is it a formal vote? Is it? Uh, yes, it is. Yeah. Uh, how do you know that it's weighted in a way that is going to bring the best uh, benefit to the United States? For instance, let me just ask why, why you're thinking of the, how you respond to me. Dr. Bolka, I would think Department of Homeland Security would be in most of those different subcategories. All of those that apply to Homeland Security Chemical uh, and biological, were represented. Explosives, um, uh, infrastructure protection, personnel protection, physical security, uh, tactical operations support. Tell me, uh, would, if you don't know, would you tell me, uh, would you get the answer to this question? How many, how many people, are you so new that you're not yet integrated? I'm sorry, sir, I didn't Are you so no, new that you're not yet integrated in each of these subgroups? Uh, our DHS components have been integrated for some time. Uh, for example, immigration, TSA, border security, and so on, uh, have been integrated for some time before DHS right. even existed. Uh, those relationships continue. Uh, really, the only new player is the DHS science and technology, and we're in the process of becoming integrated right now. And okay, Mr. Tierney, you have the floor. Uh, I'll be coming around for another round here. I, I, didn't, I did have the question to you, Mr. McCallum. Do you have an answer to that? Uh, DHS has... Uh, I'm going to ask you to talk a little louder. Your mic seems to be a little more of a problem. Uh, DHS is represented on eight of the nine subgroups in uh, TSWG. The only subgroup that it's not represented on is tactical operations support, and that's a subgroup which is focused on direct uh, support for tactical military operations overseas. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Boca, let me ask you um, a question. Department of Homeland Security, uh, has, has it done a threat assessment that you're aware of, a broad threat assessment? Uh, there's no department-wide threat assessment that I know of, Mr. Tierney. If I'm incorrect, I'll correct that for the record. No, I suspect uh, you're not. Uh, you know, I, I don't know of one either, and I wanted to okay. make that point. So you have no threat assessment, in, in essence, then, on regard to Homeland Security issues, we have no list of priorities as to what our most immediate needs are. In the large sense, I think you're probably correct. Okay. So I would think that one of the ways that logical people might have addressed the situation was to do a threat assessment to determine what our priorities are, and then through a network of all the people involved in this going right down to the local responders, we would determine what technology we may need to meet some of those needs we don't already have, then you might ask for proposals of people to meet those needs and then start going through your cooperation and analysis with the others uh, in these centers. that not sound legitimate to you? Uh, that sounds legitimate, sir, and it has been done on a component basis by many of the components of Homeland Security. To tell, what are you referring to as a component, please? Uh, border Patrol, for Border and Transportation Security, for example, or uh, critical infrastructure protection and so on. So the border security people have determined what they think they need and have made those needs known to you? 
Uh, currently, because uh, we're so new, a lot of the internal relationships have not yet been formed. Uh, in the past, they have worked with the TSWG, and we are establishing those relationships right now. I guess I'm a little mystified as to, as, you know, it's two years in since September 11th, uh, and we've been asking on this committee, both Republicans and Democrats alike, for a threat assessment since immediately after that uh, disaster. Because it made sense to everybody on this committee that that would be the first step that you would do, is to determine what your threats were to set a priority. And then I think it only stands to logic that once that's done, then you would try to put your resources to meeting those needs in order. If instead what you're telling me is that the border security decides that they've got certain needs and, and some other component, as you say, decides it and everybody just throws it into the hopper here and sees what comes out, we're probably not handling this in, in a way that's going to best and most timely serve our needs. So is there any effort afoot to put some more order and some more structure into the way we go about this with regard to homeland security issues? Yes, sir, there is. In the uh, 2004 Appropriations Act, the appropriations bill. The uh, Congress has stipulated that the research and development uh, submission for 2005 will be uh, a single submission from the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, that will be the impetus to bring together uh, the parties that uh, are already working together somewhat uh, to formalize the relationships and provide that information and that request to the Congress. And, and I assume what we'll do then is will put out to bid or request for proposals those items which are prioritized as our most immediate threats and then move on down the line as our resources permit. Yes, sir. And that's exactly what we're doing right now, is based on the priorities that have, have been defined. Within each component, but not with a, with with a large. component. We're, we're addressing those first. Right. And I guess the dilemma of that is that we may find out by 2005 that there's somewhere down the food chain and we should have been addressing a number of other things with higher priority. And I, I guess that's what sort of irritates me a little bit because we've been talking about this for so long. Let me ask you with, with one specific component would be uh, communications and interoperability uh, communication systems. Two years after September 11th, we have had uh, Mr. Cooper here, uh, Stephen Cooper testifying that nobody was quite sure who had responsibility for developing that kind of interoperability and in communication, that the actual function was at Mr. Ridge's original position in the White House, but when Mr. Ridge was designated as Secretary of Department of Homeland Services, he moved, but that responsibility didn't, and there's been some confusion until late as to who owns that project. Have you, uh, as your office, been dealing with any of the proposals that are coming forward to determine what system would be used by all of our uh, local first responders and, and their interaction with the Coast Guard and FEMA and other groups? No. No, sir. Okay. And, and why isn't that in your department, and where is it if it's anywhere at all? Uh, I don't know the answer to your question, Mr. Attorney. I'll try to find out and get you an answer. Does it sound like, isn't that a component of Homeland Security? Uh, I personally don't know, sir. But well, I, who, who would know? Well, I'll try to find out, point you in the right direction and get would, an answer to you. Would, would the gentleman yield and, 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 and sure, have plenty just... of time here? Yeah. Um, Dr. Bocum, my understanding is you have joined um, Department of Homeland Security uh, two months ago or how long ago? Uh, reported September 2nd, sir. September 2nd? Yes, sir. Okay, so I'm, uh, we're going to cut you a little bit of slack in that regard. Let me ask you this, though. Is that an indication that the office basically is not been up and running and it's just starting to get up and running now? I think with the uh, summer BAA that was issued through the TESWIG was the beginning of the Advanced Research Projects Agency office coming up and running. And as I mentioned, we put our second uh, solicitation out today, and we do have enough professionals uh, on board right now to handle uh, probably eight or ten development con uh, programs. Okay. Is there anyone else with you that uh, is potentially able to answer some questions that you might not know an answer to that might have been there a little longer? Is there anyone that could do that? Uh, no, sir. I didn't bring anyone else along with me. Okay. If you okay. tell me what the questions are, have your staff give me the questions. Yeah, I just, I just want to ask you, you know, the two, what are the two projects that you've got out so far? What was the first one? The first one was through the, uh, the TISWIG, right. which was uh, rapid prototyping of chemical and biological sensors that could be fielded very quickly. Okay, and none of the other groups had ever asked for that before? This was something unique to Homeland Security? Uh, 
It, it's not unique. However, uh, it's a need that's there for the uh, various components and first, responder, first responders, uh, and we're trying to fill some of the existing holes. The second solicitation was for the next generation of sensors, which would be cheaper, more dense, faster, and give a better situational awareness. Okay. So essentially, two years in, we've got one, one issue, one priority that's being addressed. Yes, sir. Twice. Well, actually, it's not being addressed twice. It's being addressed once for the near term, once for the for longer long term. term. All right, I'll phrase that. All right. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not, certainly there's nothing personal with you. Uh, my frustration here is, is not personal at all, but with the reorganization and, and when it was uh, implemented and how it was structured and, and what's been going on since. And I, I sense some confusion and some lack of leadership here. But the first responders in my district are at a loss on a number of different needs that they have. And frankly, contractors in my district are at a loss as to, you know, where do they go if they've got a great idea? Uh, you know, do they first try and, and get uh, to see whether or not local first responders or FEMA or Coast Guard or somebody else, you know, identifies and also recognizes that need and then move up to the chain? Do they come directly to you? Um, but the local first responders, I mean, when things go from yellow to orange, you know, they, there's all sorts of things that come into their mind as to what they need, and they don't have any idea where these are prioritized on the federal government's chain. So I, I look forward to working with you. Again, I, I'm not going to ask you a lot of questions on that because you're so new and apparently you're going to give me some information and that'll be helpful, but people need to know these answers in whatever way we can be helpful to you uh, in, in structurally on this thing. Is I think it's important to move that, um, that assessment forward, as we say here for the 2000th time, that assessment and then a prioritization and then put some meaning to all this. So thank you for your testimony. Thank you. I, I have a few more questions. I, one of the things that I'm just trying to struggle, uh, I'm struggling a little bit with, and it's, it's history that you're not really aware of, but when, when we set up the Department of Homeland Security, we visualized, or at least I did and a number of others, that it, there were four pillars to this, to this organization. And another pillar, uh, other than science and technology, was information analysis and infrastructure protection. That was, that was the whole part of, of the Department of Homeland Security that was the plug that would evaluate all intelligence information. And we had a hearing, not in this committee, but in the Select Committee on Homeland Security that it was on, uh, just discussing TTIC, which um, is the Terrorist Threat Integration Center. That's not within the Department of Homeland Security. And we're wrestling with understanding what its role is as it relates to the Department of Homeland Security. And Mr. McCollum, I'm still doing a little bit of wrestling with understanding um, how uh, Tiswick is is not is is a valuable tool in which all this information comes but but really trying to understand how uh, the Department of Homeland Security is going to make sure uh, it is not just one of so many so many players in this process now one of the things I understand is that in the 2004 budget about 35 percent of, of your budget will come from the Department of Homeland Security is that somewhat what you're hearing, and Mr. Jacob, if you care to jump in as well. Um, as, as I understand it, and it depends, we don't know yet from the Department of Homeland Security what amount they anticipate sending to us. Uh, we would anticipate our budget at this point based upon what we have heard from them to be more in the uh, neighborhood of 20 percent, but okay. uh, that varies. We're still in the formulation stage since we've, ju we've just seen the conference uh, reports. Um, but in, in this year's budget, they were a, a, about 20 to 25 percent. Now, as the Department of Homeland Security is, joins TISWIG as a department, I realize that it used to have other uh, elements within it that came from other departments that were part of TISWIG, but now that we're under this new structure. Uh, as it joins as a department under, uh, within TISWIG, it's not clear to me whether TISWIG process is best suited for what may become expansive Homeland Security technology solutions. Um, since Department of Homeland Security is only one of many votes on projects to be funded through TISWIG, how does DHS ensure that its Homeland Security funds are not being used to fund other agency priorities? And Dr. Boca, I mean, I'd like all of you to respond to that. Uh, 
since I've got my mic on, maybe I'll respond sure. first. Uh, first, I'd like to make a correction. Based on our budget from last year, there are about 15 percent of our total uh, for dollar contribution budget. in the 03. Right. No, no. In 04, no, but, we don't know what it's going to be. Right. Our information the, says it may be up to a third, but, but it's going to be obviously more than 15. One of the ways that we've attempted to ensure that the priority on protecting the uh, homeland is recognized is by adding DHS to the executive committee and in the organizational structure which you saw and is, is displayed on my page too, they, they're shown as a, uh, a technical chair which means that all of the work that we put forward from this from the nine subgroups on, on eight of nine are, uh, have senior uh, DHS representation, three of nine are chaired or co-chaired by members of DHS agencies such as TSA and the Secret Service. Uh, so they, they, they will get um, full membership at a voting level. They'll get, uh, they, they, they have a, a first pass cut at the first level of management at the uh, subgroup chairs. And then w uh, when we report our uh, proposed program plans for the year, they also sit on our executive committee so that if they feel that uh, any areas are not being adequately addressed or areas that they think are primary priorities and need to be addressed more strongly aren't being, they bring that up with our executive committee. Uh, so there are multiple levels and checks and balances within our system to ensure that a, a, you know, a primary partner in our, uh, in our, in our enterprise is, uh, is adequately um, addressed. And as um, Mr. Jacobs said a few minutes ago, this is largely a matrix government organization that really works. Um, most issues are settled on the, the good of the system, and I have not seen in the four years I've been with this organization a homeland security type issue that also wasn't a military issue and also wasn't a State Department issue. When, when there's a major technical priority that we can't cover, it's usually a gap in everybody's protection scheme. So I have not seen the, the issue yeah. of homeland security versus state versus DOD ever be an issue that got beyond the, the uh, executive committee. I don't want to just be one note on this, but let me ask Mr. Jacob and Mr. McCallum, do you, either of you then have an assessment with respect to the Department of Defense or the Department of uh, State of what your particular needs are and have you prioritized those? Let me answer it this way. Um, both my office and Ed's office receive a variety of intelligence community assessments that deal with the terrorist threat, whether they be put, whether they be put out by TTIC or whether they be put out by CIA, by DIA, what, whatever they would happen to be. There are a number of those that come out all the time. We use those as guidance when we're looking at the beginning of the year when we're starting to prioritize what it is we want to do. If those assessments are saying we need to be really more attentive to or the information is indicating, for example, as I brought up in my testimony at the outset here, uh, that terrorist groups, some of them now, are leaning more toward chem bio radiological materials and whatnot, that's a signal to us and that's something we have to do from a management perspective is pick up on the intelligence signals and then make sure that's communicated to our subgroups. We do that at the beginning of the year. So we will take a look at it and we will give our subgroups direction. We need you to emphasize this year um, CBR countermeasures. Uh, I also indicated for you that the other thing we were really concerned about, and this is based on intel reporting, uh, is the nature of the terrorist threat that emanates from new explosive formulations, bombs, that type of a thing our direction to our subgroups, specifically our physical security subgroup that handles blast mitigation countermeasures and, and other things related to bomb squads and others, uh, is to take a look at that in terms of developing requirements. So they were told right on that we were going to weight potential monetary contributions uh, in the areas of CBRN countermeasures, physical security, explosive detection, and improvised device defeat. That doesn't mean we aren't going to give money to the other subgroups, but we told them right from the get-go as we started developing the program, these are the areas we need to concentrate in. Uh, and we, then we take a look at what comes up through the requirements process. Can we envision a, a circumstance where, say, the Department of Homeland Security would prioritize some need of theirs above the things that you've given attention to or that your group has decided are going to get uh, some priority? 
that would be something we'd like to take a look at in the executive committee uh, if, uh, if DHS were to come in. And, and I, think, I think this will work itself out over time. They're, they're so new. Um, they're just now getting in, involved in the processes. Uh, if they were to come to the executive committee at, again, the beginning of the fiscal year when we start this process and say, uh, and we'd also look at the intelligence community on this, we would like to see what the intel community has to say about a given threat. But if they were to identify um, a specific area that needed to be addressed on a priority basis, we could factor that in very easily. But it's a situation where your group would have to meet and make a decision jointly, or collectively, I should say, and it could end up being in contradiction to what the Secretary of the Department believes ought to be given attention, and, and then we've got a situation on our hands. My understanding of putting this whole Department of Homeland Security together was that the Secretary was going to have ample authority uh, to sort of take some control of a situation that really needed. Now, I know we didn't do that with the Office of Management and Budget. I think that's a terrible mistake, uh, that if the Secretary decides resources have to be applied somewhere and OMB overrules them, we're out of luck. And we saw that with the Department of Energy, where the Secretary made a request of some magnitude and the Department just tossed it out the window and we ended up with a very small amount. So I, I hope there's going to be some way, Dr. Bolker and, and, and the other two gentlemen, of addressing that other than leaving it as a committee decision where we're dealing with Homeland Security, the Secretary is able to set some real direction there and, and make probably the ultimate answer as to where we have to go with respect to Homeland Security, if that means working outside your group. That's correct, Mr. Attorney. And in fact, the uh, establishing legislation that established uh, HSARPA uh, provides me with the transaction, other transaction authority and uh, contracting and legal authority to contract mm -hmm. for ourselves if we have a requirement that can't be met or can't be folded into uh, a joint development uh, or we need to modify what the product of a joint development is somewhat, we have the capability of doing that ourselves. And does that mean if you just don't think they're moving fast enough forward or putting in a high enough priority, you can go outside and do it? That's correct. Thank you. Yeah. TTIC was established in 1986, as you point out, to deal with counter-terrorist, I'm sorry, Tiswick sure. was established in, in 86 to, to deal with counterterrorism me uh, measures, innovations. Is that correct, Mr. Jacob? Yes, sir. Read counterterrorism in the largest context. Okay. We look at it as counterterrorism, anti terrorism, support for the intelligence and security elements, and also work and consequence management. So it's a very broad term. And was that the same time that Mr. Bremer uh, was, or not necessarily um, Ambassador Bremer, but when we established an ambassador on, on terrorism? Yes, sir. It was right about the same time. What I'm still wrestling with is, uh, Mr. McCollum, I, there are so many ways that we fund technology in the Department of Defense. And this is just one of the doors that you can go in. I'm just trying to uh, appreciate why DOD uh, d won't drown out uh, DHS in its need <clears throat> for uh, the protection of our homeland with innovations. I, that's kind of what I'm wrestling with right now. What is the protection that will make that not happen? And I would just tell you, I'm, I'm getting to develop a bias. For instance, I think the rebuilding of Iraq, and I support it strongly, are going into Iraq, is being run by DOD when I think it should be run by state. Uh, but it's basically, uh, it's Mr. Mr. Ambassador Bremer is, is answerable to the secretary. You're answerable to the secretary. Um, and I, I just make me feel more comfortable that somehow uh, this new agency with someone who's only been there two months, or excuse me, has been here one month, uh, is, uh, his people are going to have their voice heard. Mr. Chairman, the, the history of the TISWIG shows that the Secret Service, the um, uh, TSA, and a number of other Coast Guard have for years been primary participants in the TISWIG process and have numerous um, prototypes that, that, that we've delivered. In, and, and not just that we've delivered, those elements of, of what's now DHS help us develop those. If you remember my opening statement, the users that identify requirements to us help us work through the process and deliver them. Uh, DOD 
and state have both chartered our organization to be an interagency forum. No single organization contributes all of their R&D dollars to us for fast prototyping, and neither DOD nor DHS nor State Department. Um, the piece that they come to us with is for those parts which are interagency in nature and which, have brought, which will have broad application, there are always within each organization core responsibilities that they want to do in-house. Within DHS, even the most generous proposals to send money to this interagency body are but a small portion of their R&D budget. We would not anticipate attempting to do all of that, but in the fast prototyping world, no one is faster or more agile than we are. Just uh, before we go to the next panel, uh, would you take one of the examples that you have in your, in your extensive testimony, uh, other than um, one that you made reference to, tell me um, how it began and how we capture our investment. In other words, we're using federal dollars to, to help respond to uh, requests for funds, but some of these are going to become very viable. Uh, and, and um, frankly, uh, the manufacturers should, should do quite well in producing these for the governments. How do we capture back something? I'm not sure what you mean by capture back, Mr. Chairman. Our, our, our own investment, the money that we put um, in. Well, if, if you'd like me to just pick one of these, let me pick um, one that I don't believe any of the... Um, and, and make reference to the page, if you would. Make, page 12. Um, and I also pick it because I don't believe that anybody here is going to demonstrate this, but it's the next generation low-cost robot. Um, a few years ago, a, uh, both the Department of Defense and the National Institutes for Justice were looking for a lower-cost robot for EOD teams across the, across the community. And uh, we started out in a, uh, in a requirement setting session to begin to build a new low cost, low cost robot, something that, as the law enforcement agencies in this country tell us, needs to cost less than a squad car. Most robots are made to be very high capability uh, items of equipment and are fairly substantial in cost. But as we began looking at this with NIJ and the, in the entire community, um, we, dis we discovered uh, what was what was available commercially in um, Canada, called the Vanguard robot, for $35,000 a piece, which completed about 80% of the requirements. And we went back to the community and said, hey, these guys are ready to begin action right now. So the, the process wasn't one of long-term R&D, but the process of bringing back to the government was that we had a community of technicians and technical folks that knew what we needed to get. We had a community of users that identified what requirements they had to, to live by and what they needed, and were able to make some cost decisions to go out and get something that was good enough while we completed yeah, that, the that's development. Bu that's buying off the shelf, in a sense, right? In other words... For the most part, we're developing the rest so of it. the only cost was you're having to discover this and to make some decisions to purchase it. Some but, slight upgrades. Yeah. Uh, okay, some slight upgrades. But take, take something where an, a, a firm came in, investors came in, and they said, we have, we have this idea, we think it will benefit you tremendously, we need a sum of money to, to continue our research and prove to you that it works. Um, then you put in millions of dollars or hundreds of thousands or whatever. They then sell it to you. How do you determine price? Uh, how do you know that, uh, that they're, because you're the only purchaser, uh, how do you work out all those things? We are most frequently, sir, not the only purchaser. Um, most of the products that we put out, we attempt to put out on the commercial market. Um, for most of the people that you'll hear talk in the second panel, we identify a requirement, and in the second phase of those requirements in the white paper, we begin to identify a commercialization or technology transfer process, which is one of the focuses for selection. Um, if we can't identify what, how it's going to be transferred, who it, who's going to build it, who's going to manufacture it, who's going to maintain it, and what its cost is going to be, that's an indication for us not to move forward. Most of our items are, are items either go into a commercial status so okay, that law enforcement know, people can buy even, it. That's even better in a sense. It's, it, I'm just trying to understand 
how when you put 300,000, and I'm not suggesting anything bad, I just want to understand it. Um, I, I favor, I vote for our government trying to, uh, to uh, fund uh, those innovations that will make sense. I just want to understand how the financial transactions work. Um, it cost us 300000 for the low-cost ro robot. Um, give me something that costs more and then walk me through it. As something that, and do we get our money back ever or is it just money that's spent? I mean, if we help someone develop an item that can then be sold at significant profit and so on, does the company have any obligation to pay for those initial investments? Uh, we typically do not try to recover uh, royalties for the government. Our primary objective is to get the equipment out in the hands of the users in the fastest and most cost-effective way we can. Um, typically, the government retains rights to equipment, um, but we do not go for royalties. They're typically government purpose rights um, so that if a company is bought out and ceases to produce an item or there's some other cost piece for that, that the government retains the right to go forward and manufacture it elsewhere. But our primary objective is to produce the equipment, not, not to move for the royalties. Can I just yes. for a second? Yes. On that same thought, then, do we do anything at all about keeping that technology open for others in the industry to use? In other words, we've funded in some cases a substantial amount of money for technology to be developed. If we're not going to recoup our investment, then do we at least allow this technology, maybe with some parameters or whatever, to protect the investment of the individual there, but allow other others in the industry to then build on that or use it so that there's some competition or that others might take advantage of it? and at least do that with respect to the public, since these are public funds that have got the thing started. It, it, that is, of course, dependent. That you get into an area where I'd have to start getting my uh, I, IPR attorneys involved, but in some cases, we uh, advertise for licensing so that uh, companies can, can bid with the uh, initial uh, developer on manufacturing. Uh, but it, it's, uh, that's on a case-by-case -case basis. We encourage companies to, to team to get those kinds of things done. Uh, and we don't typically find that these kinds of things are closed. But many of the companies, you can probably address that better with the next panel, have IPR rights and have proprietary data involved with these, with these developments. Thank you. Just before we go to the next panel, I, still wrestling with the simple concept here. Do you, Dr. Volker, feel you have a mandate to do some of what Tiswig does internally. In other words, do you believe that you uh, need to set up an operation where people can go directly to you for funding? Or is all the funding that is going to be out of Department of Homeland Security going to go through this funnel of Tiswick? As I said in my testimony, Mr. Chairman, uh, this fiscal year, this coming fiscal year, the Congress has stipulated that $75 million we spend on rapid prototyping. My total budget this year in HRPRO will probably be around $350 million. Uh, your question was, do I have a mandate to do rapid prototyping other than through TISWIG? I believe I have the capability to do it. Uh, depending on the uh, interagency and interdepartment nature of the requirements, uh, it may be that working through TISWIG is the best way to do it. If it's a, something that's unique to one of the DHS components, uh, then I can do it myself because I have contracting officers and legal uh, personnel who can, and we can let contracts. So for the rest of my budget, uh, I, I am establishing a uh, contracting uh, capability. Uh, the appropriate legal support is uh, made available. And as I said, the other administrative support is available to me as well. Mr. Jacob, just walk me through this as you, as you try to sort this out. Um, should DHS have the capability to have its own, um, uh, have the ability to basically duplicate what TISWIG does and just do it internally and not have to go through TISWIG? Let me answer it this way. There are a lot of departments and agencies that are in the TSWG. Many of them have their own budgets for research and development. 
the FBI, the agency, uh, Department of Agriculture, whatever. What we offer in TSWG is another avenue. There may be a requirement they have that they don't really know how to work. They can come to TSWG with that. They may have a requirement that is going to be useful for more than just one agency and they can't afford it themselves. They can bring that to TSWG. If that fits with the requirements we have, we may be able to partner with them and leverage monies. Uh, we don't duplicate what individual agencies do. So we aren't uh, taking anybody else's money to do this. What we have is a program that Say addresses multi-agency requirements. That doesn't, that doesn't requirements. make sense to me. I don't know what you mean you don't duplicate. Uh, take, take, oh, go on. <laughs> okay. Uh, agencies that have their own R&D budgets can fund R&D within their own agencies. Right. And so you're not going to do the same project in both places. Is that what you mean? That is one of the things we would make sure didn't right. happen. Okay. But, but it still doesn't, you know, it's almost like if you don't get it so Tiswick, you can go directly to the department, and maybe that's good or bad, I don't know. But it, it is, it, it's just, um, I'm just really trying to understand how this new agency, the Department of Homeland Security, kind of fits in. And I realize, Mr. McGallum, that this, it, it used to be an old agency in the, in the fact that you had members and do have members who were there well before we had a Department of Homeland Security. We just collected under the Department of Homeland Security. But I could make an argument that you should put Tiswick under the Department of Homeland Security. I mean, I, I could just make an argument that that could or should happen. Just tell me uh, what would be the pros and cons of it. Uh, the primary con, sir, is that the uh, military warfighting effort and the offensive side of that, the uh, intelligence support that we do and the support for the Department of State would be lost. The defensive component is a subset. Uh, the kinds of things that DHS are doing, is doing to protect the nation are of primary importance, but it's a subset of the total combating terrorism uh, technology development effort. We can do both because the technologies that are developed are are, are appropriate for both. Theoretically, if, if um, a, a company a, came t to be funded and Tiswick said no, uh, could they theoretically go to, and Dr. Mr. Jacob would like you to respond as well, could they theoretically go to the Department of Homeland Security or the Agriculture Department, depending where area, what area it was, and, and, and submit that application hoping the department will do it directly? It's possible. Yes, sir. In fact, in uh, in, D in DHS, we've established a uh, an email address yes. Yes. No. that we use to solicit uh, un well that we use to collect unsolicited proposals. It's science.technology at dhs.gov. Uh, each one of those unsolicited proposals is uh, is examined. It's compared against requirements. It's circulated through the uh, uh, department uh, to see if there's any interest and a response is sent back to the individual. Uh, we treat those, uh, those proposals very, very seriously. Uh, s some of them are frivolous. Uh, many of them are not. So we do, we do have the opportunity uh, within the components of the department and within science and technology to, uh, uh, to collect and process unsolicited proposals and also to solicit proposals for uh, requirements that are either unique to a component or unique to DHS. When we sold, um, when we debated, and when I was sold on having a Department of Homeland Security, one of the arguments and one of the pillars was your pillar, uh, your directorate, that basically we said this is one place to assess technology uh, for counterterrorism to protect our homeland. And what I'm getting a feeling is uh, that, that um, Tiswig is one place and probably the primary place, uh, but then we can still go to all the different departments and agencies uh, to, um, to get funding as well. That's kind of what I'm left feeling. Is that the way I should feel, Mr. McCollum? Uh, not as far as DHS goes, sir, okay. because the, the intent uh, of the Congress and the intent of the department is to grow the Department of Science and or the uh, Directorate of Science and Technology to perform exactly that function. Well, that's what I thought. 
That's how I started this hearing thinking. How do you react to that, Mr. McCollum? I, I would react by looking within the, the working groups as I've seen them operate. Um, industry or academia, both U.S. and foreign, do bid on requirements that go out. They bid not only to different agencies but within agencies for uh, people who are looking for the kinds of products that they're selling. Um, but as I've sat through some of these subgroup meetings and observed, uh, frequently a proposal will come in that the Coast Guard or the, the Navy or the New York Police Department will say, we looked at that, here's what we thought about it, we didn't fund it. We also uh, have people c step up and say, hey, we're already funding that proposal. We're already, uh, we've already committed funds to it. Don't, don't move down that lane. We not only choose things to fund, we choose things not to fund. Uh, an, an example from a few years ago was, uh, was one where the Department of Energy that had been doing research in both physical security, largely at Sandia National Laboratory, and explosives detection at some of the other weapons labs through brokered through TESWIG, made a, a deal with the FAA that the FAA, because of their funding, was going to uh, fund the pri primarily explosives detection and DOE was going to fund primarily physical security so that we wouldn't have a duplication and we would have a, a uh, more cohesive federal effort at uh, both physical security and explosives detection. Before uh, Mr. Tierney asks questions, I, if I if I had an innovative idea from the private sector, would I go to Tiswick first and it impact the Department of Homeland Security or would go to Department of Homeland Security? Would I go first to Department of Homeland Security, get it, and if I didn't get it, go to you to have you reconsider or would I do it in reverse? We respond to specific requirements. When our sessions sit down and look, we define specific requirements that we are looking for. Uh, the DHS broad agency announcement that we just published for them had 51 defined requirements, and they would respond to those requirements. It's, it's just not a, a, a come one, come all. We, we advertise for specific user-defined requirements for technology. But, but what, what about the person that has thought of the idea that you haven't thought of asking, but it's brilliant? Well, I mean, no, let me just make the point. I mean, I, we've had, I had a, 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 a homemaker who was a, a scientist, but now at home, and she came up with an extraordinary idea in terms of collecting data uh, while she was doing stuff at home. And uh, nobody asked her for this idea. She happened, the, the creativity of the American citizen was at work. And where would she go? Would she go to you first, or would she go to the Department of Homeland Security? That's really the question I'm asking. I I'm, not, I'm not trying to create a no, problem. I, I, I suspect she can go wherever she wants. We do take unsolicited proposals. We pull boards together and examine them. Frequently in the last year or year and a half, we've taken those kinds of proposals from the Office of uh, Homeland Security when Governor Ridge was, in the, was operating out of the White House and more recently from the Department of Homeland Security and staff those around the federal government when they didn't meet one of our technology requirements where we knew that uh, other agencies were looking for those kinds of issues, or if they weren't, that they might be interested in them because they looked attractive to us. So we staff those out and, and send those to people who have, who, as we call our sponsors, and who might have the money or the interest to fund those kinds of things. Our unsolicited proposals go through much, excuse me, sir, go through much the same process. Uh, we look at the, uh, at the idea. Uh, we look at our needs in DHS. Uh, we have representatives on working groups in uh, Tiswick, and we also have the executive community or executive committee uh, membership in Tiswick. So an unsolicited proposal that comes to us can go through exactly the same process that it would have gone had it gone to uh, Mr. McCollum's organization. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Just, uh, Dr. Boken, let me ask you this. You have two ongoing projects that you've got in Tiswick right now. And I assume that all of your components may well be using parts of your research and development budget or your research development budget may be being used to support some concepts that some of your components want research. Do you have an inventory of what's being done outside of Tiswig right now within any of the agencies or uh, components under your, your uh, body? 
In the area of uh, uh, chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, and explosives, uh, we do have a pretty good list of what's going on in the user agencies. Yes, sir. Yeah, might you make that available to the committee for our review? Yes, sir. Okay. And uh, are there areas where you, there may be things going on that you don't believe you have a, a handle on it yet? I'm sure there are things going on that I don't know about yet. In terms of research and development, would it pass to that? Yes, sir. Really? That's interesting. Um, well, uh, as you find out those things, that might be interesting for us to know, too, and when you think that you've got a, a grip on it and got a little bit of control in determining what that is, we'd like to know when that point arrives, or at least might give us an estimate now when you think that point will be, and then let us know when it arrives. My concern is that you know, we didn't give the Secretary the kind of authority that I think would really make this thing work. I mentioned that earlier in terms of the budget, and I, I want to make sure that in Homeland Security, some central individual or, or aspect here is determining what our needs are, setting a priority, and then making darn sure that they are being addressed. And I don't have a problem with them being addressed to Tiswick if that's the best way to go and everybody's sharing uh, sort of a sweeping idea of knocking out the stuff that's already been filed somewhere else so it's not duplicated or whatever, but I do want to make sure that we're working in a sense that when we think something's important for Homeland Security, it gets done and doesn't have to just get in line and queue up uh, with other concepts on that. So if you do that, I'd appreciate it. Yes, sir. I, I don't have a timetable for you right now, but I'll work with committee staff to establish one and, and to submit the report. Thank you. Thank all of you, gentlemen. Thank you. Let me just invite uh, uh, each of you to make any comment that you think we should have uh, respond to any question you think we should have asked uh, or to make any comment before uh, uh, we go to the next panel. And But before you do, let me just acknowledge, I know, uh, Dr. Boca, you're, you're new here, but you have a distinguished career, so you bring tremendous expertise. And I didn't mean to imply that being new didn't mean that you don't bring something significant to the table. It's just this is a... I, I want to be fair to you in the sense this is a new effort and you're trying to get things under control. Uh, and uh, Mr. Jacob and Mr. McAllen, I know you have, uh, you work uh, significant hours in this effort and you've had tremendous successes. We're just trying to sort out what we've done in the last few years and understand how it works. Um, so we thank all three of you for your service to our country um, very sincerely. And uh, do you have any final comments that you wish to make? Mr. Jacob. Yes, if I could just add one. We didn't talk about um, really the, the foreign aspect, the international aspect of the TSWG program. Uh, we have been able, through those contacts with our current three partners, to develop a lot of technology which is not only useful to us for our counterterrorism efforts, whether they be domestic or whether they be what we're using overseas, and those countries as well. It permits us to leverage a lot of these resources we talked about and also to access their technology bases. Uh, so when you ask um, about the value of the program and looking at it, uh, we tend to look at it as, as not homeland security on the one hand and the rest of the world on the other. Technology is technology. We can use it here. We can use it abroad. We can use it with our friends. Uh, and the value we get out of leveraging all these resources is, has been invaluable for the U.S. government as well as for our foreign partners in this war on terrorism. This committee, in response to that, um, had an extraordinary uh, opportunity to see some of the technology that uh, the Israelis had in terms of, um, uh, without going into much detail, uh, how they would, uh, those who had been uh, captured, uh, how they would uh, uh, find a way to, to, to save captured, captured uh, folks in Israel and how they would confront the terrorists who held them. And the technology they had was so simple and yet so brilliant. Um, and uh, I would like to, uh, I'm, I'm delighted that you responded to this area because it's very important that there be that dialogue. And it raises the point, Dr. Volker, that uh, Department of Homeland Security, while it's domestic, we will learn tremendously from our international. Uh, uh, yes, sir. And in point of fact, sir, we are opening those doors for the Department of Homeland Security with our existing three partners using our existing program. And we're looking at possibly expanding with a couple of other foreign partners. We will also make that same offer to DHS. And it's an example, I think, of how our program has helped DHS get up and running and will help them in the future. Uh, well, my staff is happy you brought this up because they wanted me to ask you about the international side, so thank you. Do you have any other comment, Mr. McCallum? I would probably just like to close by um, 
pointing out that what we like, both state and defense, like to see this as a collaborative process. It's not one by which we're uh, insisting that agencies come to the table or that they um, send money. Uh, we're, it's, it's a forum by which the larger agencies have found, I think, that they can collaborate and ensure that they know what's happening in other agencies, and indeed, sometimes within their own agencies, because of the breadth and scope of this program. Thank you. Dr. Boker. Well, as you said, Mr. Chairman, I'm relatively new in the, uh, in the organization, but I would like to thank the committee and the Congress for the, uh, the support and the confidence that was expressed in our fiscal year 04 S&T budget. Uh, we'll do our best to execute it wisely. I'm sure you will. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. Our final panel and our second panel is Dr. Uh, Gordon Patel, President, JP Laboratories, Middlesex, New Jersey. Mr. Jag Sawicki, Director of Business Development, Geomet Technologies, Germantown, Maryland. Our, th Mr. Our third panelist is Mr. Lee F. Sward, Program Manager, Military Systems Division, iRobotic Corp. Burlington, Massachusetts. Um, our fourth panelist is Mr. Richard Mastronardi, Vice President of Product Management, American Science and Engineering, Inc., and Billerica, Massachusetts. And our next panelist is Mr. Bruce uh, DeGracia, Chairman, Homeland Security Industries Association, Washington, D.C. Uh, we have Mr. Kenneth P. Ducey, President, Marketland Technologies, Inc., Ridgefield, Connecticut, and for the record, he is first among equals among this panel. And uh, finally, uh, Mr. Lawrence D. Borey, Vice President of Federal Government Relations, HDR, Inc. And so uh, what we will do is we will ask you all to stand. Sorry, we get you seated there. Can, um, if you'd stand, and I swear you in. Thank you. Do we have all the panelists here? Sorry, it's such a crowded table here. Raising your right hand, please, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Note for the record that our witnesses have responded in the affirmative. Um, thank you for your patience as uh, we had the first panel, but um, is Dr. Patel is the first, and Mr. Schwicky and Mr. Sword is third, Mr. Mastronardi is fourth in this. Is that we got it worked out here? Okay. You are Mr. Ducey? Yes. Okay. <laughs> now, let me uh, just um, say to you, you, you have prepared comments. I would, uh, given that we have uh, seven of you, it would be helpful if you would stay closer to the five minutes. Uh, but don't read fast. I'd prefer you just to leave something out. Uh, if they choose to, they may. But, um, and, and frankly, you don't need to read. You probably would do a better job just describing some points you want us to know. It would be helpful if you responded to some of the issues that came up um, from the first panel. And so it may be that you'd like to submit your, your, your testimony for the record and just speak extemporaneously. So um, we're going to start as you are lined up, I think. That's how we're doing it. Yeah. So Dr. Patel, thank you very much for being here. Mr. Chairman, member of the committee, uh, thank you for inviting me to testify about counterterrorism technology, especially the product we have developed. JP Laboratories have developed a credit card size, low cost radiation dosimeter, as I have in my hand, and I have provided samples to you, both radiated and unirradiated sample. The dosimeter can be used to monitor level of radiation, expo radiation exposure in an event of radiological attack by terrorists. It is widely believed that terrorists have a new weapon called dirty bomb. A dirty bomb is an ordinary explosive packed with a radioactive material. When detonated, it would spread radioactive dust. High dose of radiation such as X-ray emitted by radioactive dust can cause cancer and even death. A dirty bomb could cause widespread panic, massive disruption, and while, while rendering the surrounding area uninhabitable for years. In an event of a detonation of a dirty bomb, it is imperative that people affected by the dirty bomb and the first responders need to quickly assess the radiation exposure. If people affected by a dirty bomb know their radiation exposure, panic 
and a concern will be minimized. If they have a variable inexpensive radiation dosimeter, they will know their radiation exposure. If they are not exposed to radiation or received very low dose, they would not need to worry and would not need to rush to, the heart, to a hospital. However, those who have received high dose may go to hospital and physicians would know whom to treat first. In order to determine radiation exposure, hospitals will need to, to obtain blood samples from every potential victim. That will be practically impossible to do with so many people affected by a dirty bomb. A panic among the people and their concern can be minimized if they have a variable, easy to read personal radiation dosimeter. JP Labs has developed a credit card size radiation dosimeter, we call it SIRAD, for self-indicating instant radiation alert dosimeter, which can be used to monitor high energy radiation release in, in, a, in an event of a dirty bomb attack. When exposed to radiation from a dirty bomb or nuclear detonation, the sensing strip, which is in the center of this badge, the sensing, when exposed to radiation from the dirty bomb the, or nuclear detonation, the sensing strip of SIRAD develops blue color instantly and color intensifies with the dose, <coughs> providing the wearer and the medical personnel instantaneous information of the victim's cumulative exposure to radiation. The dose is estimated by matching the color of the sensing strips with the color reference chart and the number printed on the side of the sensing strip. It can take days to get such information by other methods currently available. SIRAD is inexpensive, would cost less than about $10. JP Labs has developed several products with the federal funding. The development of SIRAD was funded by Department of Defense, Naval Sea System Command in 1997 to 1999, and lately by technical support working group TISWIC. TISWIC recognized SIRAD's significance to the, to the first responder and has proceeded to make them aware of the dosimeter availability. TISWIC sele has selected our proposed second proposal for funding, what we call smart dosimeter, in which we are eliminating the color reference chart and number would be read by automatically. And also it would not indicate, if, if there is any false positive, it would be indicated. A week ago, I had an opportunity to meet many first responders at the Technology for Public Safety in Critical Incidents Response Conference organized by the National Institute of Justice at, in St. Louis, Missouri. This week has helped many organizations put a number of products and processes into the hands of the first responder to fight terrorism. We believe that TSWG can do even better job if it becomes an independent agency or with a larger budget. I will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, during the course of, um, of your testimony, you may want to tell us whether this was solicited or unsolicited, you know, if, if this was something that the government ideally is using or whether it's going to go in the open market. But I'm not going to ask you to respond now, Dr. Patel, but if you can incorporate in your statements, uh, sure. it would be, be helpful if you can. Good afternoon. My name is Jack Sawicki, and it is an honor to be invited to testify before you today on our experience with the Technical Support Working Group, or TISWIG. I'm Director of Business Development for GMA Technologies Division of Versar Corporation, a small business headquartered in Springfield, Virginia. We've been in the business of response, testing, research, and development with chemical and biological agents and other hazardous materials for over 30 years. I also live in Arlington, Virginia, where I'm a member of the Cherry Hill Volunteer Fire Department and represented Arlington from 1999 until September 2001 in the Department of Defense, Department of Justice, Interagency Bureau for Counterterrorism. GEOMET was first awarded our first TISWI contract to develop as personal protective ensembles for first responders and medical personnel. Uh, DTAPs, disposable toxic agent protective ensembles, and I have two here today, designed to provide protection from chemical, biological, and radiological materials of terrorist industrial origin. And these were actually submitted to answer your question, sir, um, to a very general requirement that came out, and we were specifically targeted to these, uh, to these users. One of the requirements that we had in the um, 
negotiations was the proper integration of protective suits with boots, gloves, and respirators without the use of inherently unreliable field expedient measures such as duct tape. And one of the comments I'd like to make um, to Mr. Turney, uh, that, that specific requirement was given us in a meeting with Mass General Hospital. Um, we had the users in the emergency room at one of the early demonstrations there. They said, we don't have time to be fooling around with tape and things like that when we actually have an emergency. We developed four systems, two for firefighters and hazmat teams that typically use self-contained breathing apparatus, one for emergency medical services personnel you'd normally see on ambulances uh, or in other types of uh, response equipment, and one for hospital emergency room personnel. The EMS and hospital sound alerts are the ones I have here today, the white one for the hospital personnel and the, and the green one for the first responders. These items are currently offered for sale by our firm with several subcontractors, including the DuPont Company and Global Secure, On Guard, and North Safety Companies. One barrier we have encountered in the marketplace to try to show you some of the problems I guess we see with the process is that many users are still accepting cheaper what I call duct tape fixes in purchasing all kinds of equipment with federal funds, even though they do not meet applicable safety standards, such as those from the National Fire Protection Association that have actually been endorsed by the Interagency Board. Um, I'd suggest that Congress in the future might, might do some work in that area to try to make sure that the equipment that first responders get does meet these minimum standards. <coughs> Another contract that GMET has had with TISWIG was the Rapid Contaminated Carcass and Plant Disposal System, if I could have that third fixture which was funded by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. The charge in this program was to design a portable system that could be distributed to each state, probably to veterinary colleges, and could be rapidly trucked to outbreak sites throughout the United States. The incinerators must safely burn plant or animal materials that were contaminated with biological agents such as anthrax, hoof and mouth, etc. Currently, the state of the art for disposal of such material is open burning or burial, neither of which are completely effective. One requirement with the system had to uh, that the system had to automatically accept entire longhorn steers, which weigh up to about 2,000 pounds, tree trunks, truckloads of chickens, et cetera, at a, rate of, a minimum rate of 120,000 pounds per day without putting out any pollution. Um, to do this, if you're in a technology, our guys went crazy with this. We had a grinder with an 80,000-pound 80, blade, which is required to take these longhorn steers. It's quite a neat neat design. Unfortunately, the uh, design, while the design phase was successfully completed, the project was canceled due to lack of funding. Um, again, if you see the picture up there, the material is dumped into the front end basically and everything automatically comes out the back end as smoke and ash. And the veterinarians at uh, USDA that were over in the UK burning the carcasses from the uh, uh, hoof and mouth disease over there were the big proponents of that effort. And they really felt that there was a lot of contamination spread from just open burning. And I might add in Virginia where I live, um, a lot of chicken feathers ended up in people's swimming pools and houses miles away from this last um, incident that we had where I think they burned something like a million chickens at open and open burial pits in, in uh, the Shenandoah Valley. In 2002, we were awarded another TISWIG contract to develop a heat stress calculator, which was given earlier. And we got into this as our firm had personal experience due to the history of performing environmental remediation. And we did the disinfection of GSA Building 401, which processes mail for the executive branch. And we also handled part of the uh, cleanup of the former Soviet Union biological weapons dump site in Uzbekistan. The temperatures were around 100 degrees in both cases. And again, the heat stress calculator allowed workers to determine how long they can safely operate in personal protective equipment. And I might add our subcontractor on that was the former director of the uh, US Army Research Institute of Environmental Medicine up in Natick, Massachusetts. Our experience with TISWIC has been generally good. Um, we have one suggestion for improving the process. The one-page quad chart format in some cases did not allow sufficient space to provide enough information for evaluation in our opinion. And we suggest that firms be allowed to provide a two-page mini white paper at the same time they put in the quad chart. If the reviewers were to see a quad chart that interests them but have questions about the proposal, two-page white paper could be consulted for additional information. And we believe that there may be some proposals that have not been funded as reviewers were not able to fully understand the concept based on this small, small picture. That thank you. Thank, my you. thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Mr. Sword. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, we, of we, we do not allow we do not allow people who testify before us to play with toys, sir. This is <laughs> Have Last week, I had someone who was eating at the table, so this is getting a little strange here. Uh, tell us about it. 
I'm sorry, we'll start your clock over again here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of this distinguished subcommittee for the honor to testify on my company's experience with and opinions of the technical support working group process. iRobot Corporation is a young entrepreneurial company in Burlington, Massachusetts. While we are a small business, we are the largest supplier of mobile robots and recognized as a technological leader in our field. My name is Lee Sword and I'm a program manager in the military systems division of iRobot. I lead the five TISWIG funded projects that are investigating technologies for the next generation of explosive ordnance disposal tools. My remarks today will include iRobot's experiences with the TISWIG process, a brief capitalistic view of my project's target market, and conclude with my opinion related to a potential improvement in the process. iRobot is in the business to bring robotic technology into the mainstream through defense and commercial channels. Our team of 76 dedicated engineers have worked on robotic systems that ventured miles into the earth, journeyed to other planets, revealed insights into civilizations that no longer exist, and have improved the situational awareness of our troops in combat. We have submitted a total of 34 responses to four different broad agency announcements from TISWIG. Solicitations to which we responded span the spectrum from the narrow focus of requesting a next generation of explosive ordnance disposal robotic tools to the more general request for technology to combat terrorism. In each case, we believe that the solicitations were posted with appropriate technical detail, clear instructions with regard to how to properly respond, and provided reasonable time frames for the responses to be generated. Noteworthy is the fact that none of the solicitations initially requested full proposals but instead asked for either white papers, white papers or single-page quad charts. Five of iRobot's 34 responses to TISWIG generated requests for full proposals, and all five have resulted in contracts to develop proof-of-concept prototypes. TISWIG and iRobot share some common visions for the future of robotics. We share the opinion that in order to be useful, advanced technologies must be developed with the end user's needs in mind. Without clear objectives and measurable success criteria, scientists and engineers will tend to create really cool but useless technology. The benefit of modular designs is another shared vision that has already served our company well. The robot presented at this hearing was configured as an explosive ordnance disposal robot, yet shares the same base chassis as those currently in use by our forces in Afghanistan and Iraq. Our robots deployed overseas have a scout payload installed where the EOD arm is on this robot. The need for interoperability is a third area of shared vision. TISWIG is defining a common architecture for robots, payloads, and control units that will allow compliant equipment from multiple vendors to seamlessly integrate into useful systems. We at iRobot endorse this approach and are working with TISWIG to refine and mature the concept so true plug-and-play capability can be delivered to the end user. The end users for the next generation tools being developed are local, state, and federally supported bomb squads. Given the total number of active bomb squads in existence, there is very little financial incentive for private industry to invest large sums of money in breakthrough technologies. The past two decades have seen only small, evolutionary changes to existing equipment. But the recent infusion of money from TISWIG is causing revolutionary changes in the capability and utility of EOD equipment that otherwise may have taken many years to occur on its own iRobot's experience with the TISWIG process was and continues to be a positive one. The entire process from release of the broad agency announcement to issuance of development contracts is handled in a professional manner by experienced individuals that obviously have a good grasp of the end user's needs with an understanding of the limitations of the available equipment. My one recommendation for improvement in the TISWIG process would involve implementing some mechanism for quickly increasing staffing levels to address unanticipated workloads. I'm specifically addressing the overload experience following the release of the Homeland Defense Broad Agency announcement, where there are a total of 12,500 responses were received. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This concludes my statement. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, he just pointed out that you live in his district. Is this correct? Yes, sir. What's that? Yeah, and the company's there. Oh, terrific. But you're uh, still, Mr. Ducey, first among equals here. Mr. Mass, uh, Trinardi, thank you. Yes, I'm Mr. Chairman and uh, member of the committee, Tierney. On behalf of American Science and Engineering, ASNE, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today about our relationship with TISWIG and where I think it's been beneficial both to our company and to the nation. We have a relationship with TISWIG that goes back to as far as 1998 from what I can determine.
Uh, since the tragedy of September 11th, the role of TISWIG has become more important than ever. I believe that the uh, mandate that they have to identify appropriate technologies and facilitate the rapid prototyping of these technologies is extremely vital. Our company has been in business since 1958, and we've pioneered uh, a lot of work in detection and advancing the fields of X-ray astronomy, medical imaging, non-destructive testing, and more importantly today, security screening. Anyone in this room has passed through a security checkpoint in this building that uses ASNE equipment. If you had a, uh, an object x-rayed today, it was with our equipment. The same would be true of pretty much every government building in Washington, D.C. Our equipment is used every day throughout the world to inspect a broad range of items. These range from pocketbooks that, uh, of people entering the White House to uh, delivered goods at Andrews Air Force Base to cargo containers that are entering the port of Hong Kong. For our company, it's a constant challenge to keep up with the terrorists who are perfecting methods to circumvent security measures every day. And I believe this is where TISWIG comes into the picture. TISWIG can support this effort by speeding up the time to market of many new technologies. And most recently, TISWIG has agreed to help us develop and test a new product called our Z Backscatter Van, or ZBV. I've enclosed a couple of figures in the testimony that might be helpful. Um, this single-sided x-ray product uses our patented Z Backscatter technology to, to identify hidden contraband. It's built into a small maneuverable delivery type van and allows the user to both covert or overtly look into vehicles and cargo containers. It can easily identify explosives, weapons, and in some cases can be used to effectively look under people's clothing to find uh, suicide bombs. We have an additional capability that we offer on this product called radiation, radioactive threat detection. This can identify the radioactive materials that are often associated with uh, dirty bombs. They are typically gamma emitters. There's also a uh, capability to detect neutron emitters that are often the materials that are used uh, to make nuclear weapons. Recognizing the potential of this product, the ZBV, TISWIG has agreed to uh, help us develop additional capabilities. These capabilities include um, the, the ability to operate in remote and uh, quite challenging hostile environments such as that in Iraq. What they're going to help us develop is remote operation capability. This will allow us to operate the equipment in a covert manner and to keep our soldiers and personnel sufficiently distant from the, uh, the process so that if any explosion occurs, they will not get blown up. We find that TISWIC has a very accessible and user-friendly website, and it's often the starting point of any project like ours. This project, by the way, was a response to a broad agency announcement. Uh, it has broad appeal, but the near-term deployment and where TISWIG is providing focus is in the high-threat regions such as Iraq. As a member of the uh, TISWIG website, we are kept aware of the opportunities through the broad agency announcements. Our first submittal, like everybody else, is a quad chart. We provide um, a concept drawing of the idea, description of how it would meet an operational capability that's been uh, asked for, and it gives us gives uh, TISWIG a rough order magnitude of cost, schedule, and deliverables. This one-page document responds to is, uh, is supposed to be responded to in as little as 45 days, and some takes, sometimes takes longer, several months. I think everybody else has described the next step, which is a white paper, which also takes some time, and uh, the proposal. We understand that, that TISWIG often has something in excess of 12,000 quad charts, and it's pretty daunting, uh, to say the least. We believe TISWIG does an effective job at processing the high volume of interest, uh, but I think as most companies will tell you, we wish the process could be faster. Often large amounts of times can transpire between various stages of the proposal process, in our case, uh, this project has taken over a year from quad, jot, quad chart to contract. Uh, TISWIG has taken a number of initiatives to uh, host meetings to discuss the upcoming projects and to educate companies how to be more effective in the proposal process. This is certainly one example of how TISWIG is trying to speed up the process. In addition to speeding up the process, we have two recommendations that could be addressed by TISWIG in order to make their process even more effective. First, 
We believe that more detailed feedback on why quad charts or white papers were rejected would be helpful to submitters. Submitters would be better prepared for the next time. Second, there appears to be a preference for funding a lot of small projects and very few larger projects, and we believe the emphasis should be on the right technology to meet the demand uh, of the requirements proposed by the operating uh, organizations. From our vantage point, we find the relationship with TISWIG very beneficial to both parties. The people uh, appear to be quite competent technically, they're dedicated, hardworking, and we also believe that they are extremely busy and juggle many multiple projects. Many of the issues that uh, we, we feel are important today could be mitigated by additional staff. TISWIG serves a vital role in helping companies like ours develop new technologies, and we're look, looking forward to our new project. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. De Gracia. <clears throat> I need you to make sure that mic's on and bring, her, bring that mic in front of you. Yes, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Tierney, it's a pleasure to appear before you today. Accompanying me are several of our members, including two who will testify as well. One of them is Larry Borey of HDR from Orlando, Florida, and Ken Ducey of Markland Technologies. Also accompanying me are a number of other HSIA representatives, including Bruce Aitken, who's HSIA's president, Yasmin Chirado Chiodini of Intelliorg, who is the executive director of HSIA's Florida chapter and Southeast Regional Center, Hank Chase of ITS Federal, and others. The Homeland Security Industries Association was organized in November 2001 and formally launched about a year ago. Right now, we have about 400 members, ranging from the largest defense contractors, the names of which everyone here would recognize, through mid-sized firms to startups and, uh, uh, and, and even some uh, incubator companies. Our representatives here reflect this cross-section. Now, in my oral statement today, I'm going to summarize the views and recommendations of HSIA and then ask that our complete written statement be included in the record of this proceeding. The association's views represent, of course, a consensus of HSIA and not the opinion or the particular views of any one member. After my presentation, both of the uh, HSIA member firms who were invited by the subcommittee to testify will comment on their own experience with uh, TISWIG and generally on their experience with federal and state procurement in the Homeland Security area. Now, generally, HSIA wishes to commend Secretary Ridge and the Department of Homeland Security on a successful launch of this massive new department last January. Given that the significant increases in funding for Homeland Security only began to come available last March, we believe that DHS has moved quickly to implement Homeland Security improvements. Now, of course, HSIA members and other companies in the HLS industry, not to mention first responders in their state and local governments, are frankly frustrated with the pace of HLS funding and the early reliance on sole source procurements. We attribute this, however, to the evolutionary pace of developing a new federal department and the organizational challenges that are understandably associated with such a development. Now, with respect to TISWIG and Homeland Security procurement generally, we have the following recommendations. First, we think very highly of uh, the abbreviated procurement process used by TISWIG, and we think it should be followed by, uh, uh, by Homeland Security procurements generally at the federal level. Second, we think that TISWIG's separate procurement website, www.bids.tiswig.gov, should be used as a model for separately posting federal homeland security RFPs, RFIs, and RFQs. Third, TISWIG's dedicated website for its procurements should be more clearly linked to the DHS website. Fourth, the Department of Homeland Security should organize a series of seminars around the country to educate firms about TISWIG. In our own organization, we held a meeting to discuss the, uh, uh, this, our testimony before the subcommittee, and we asked our members how many of them had worked with TISWIG and how many of them were even aware of it. It was only a very small minority, frankly, who had even heard of TISWIG, let alone worked with them. Fifth, we believe that greater use should be made of the Small Business Administration's offices around the country to educate firms about TISWIG. Sixth, 
Congress should appropriate additional funding for TISWIG in order to permit it to conduct debriefing meetings with firms who have unsuccessfully sent equipment or technology to TISWIG and also to implement a debriefing system with respect to unsolicited equipment or technology sent to TISWIG. We don't expect that 12,000 uh, people will be talked to, but we do believe that the ones that got close should be given an opportunity to be told what they did wrong and how they could do better the next time. Seventh, we believe the incidence of federal and state homeland security sole source contracting should decrease. You've got a very large group of uh, homeland security providers, and we don't believe that it should be concentrated in the hands of one or two companies, even if those companies are our members. Eighth, we believe the administration should consider an interagency homeland security contracting summit further to the goal of creating a harmonized homeland security procurement system. Ninth, Congress should authorize and the administration should implement a system of security cleared industry advisors from each major area of homeland security. Tenth, the Department of Homeland Security should much more frequently conduct the very successful industry days in order to educate industry regarding DHS goals and plans regarding HLS procurement. And finally, the DHS should attempt to collect state and local HLS procurement information and post it on the dedicated HLS website recommended above. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Uh, Mr. Ducey. Chairman Even Chairman, though you're first among equals, it's still five minutes. <laughs> so what's that? Even though you're first among equals, it's still five minutes. <laughs> you only get five minutes, sir. Thank you. Maybe an extra second. Chairman Shays, distinguished members of the subcommittee, good morning. My name is Ken Ducey. I am president of Markland Technologies, a small company dedicated to delivering integrated security solutions to protect our country against the threat of terrorism located in the great state of Connecticut. I want to thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss this matter of vital importance. The U.S. government and private industry have a long history of working together to find solutions to the most vexing challenges, challenges facing this great nation. It is the entrepreneurial spirit of small, not big businesses that have led to the technological breakthroughs that have revolutionized our way of living. We all know the stories of entrepreneurs who have overcome impossible obstacles to develop innovative products that have made the U.S. the great nation it is. This time will be no different. If we can create a system where the entrepreneur and the U.S. government work together the two most powerful forces in our country, we will create a synergy unlike anything ever seen before. Even the accomplishments mentioned will pale in comparison to what we can achieve in the area of homeland security powered by cutting edge technology. The first step for developing a winning strategy is to create a roadmap to success. This roadmap should be developed by a team of experts from the private as well as the public sectors representing all aspects of the issues. This effort requires the development of a research environment which is driven directly by the field needs of the end user. The innovative capability must be designed from day one to fit into a system that meets the needs of the end user and goes into cost-effective volume production expeditiously with proper systems for maintenance and training which are so key to the end user's success. To, to accomplish this goal, DHS needs to develop in TISWIG, in TISWIG and other organizations the type of mindset an organizational structure that has been utilized very successfully within the DOD. The elements of such an organization are an ability to invest in basic technologies that can lead to fundamental technical advantages in order to create substantive capabilities, the formation of working groups that would advocate technologies together, the definition of strategic challenges in detail across multiple threat spectrum scenarios, support for the conceptual integrated system solutions which incorporate new capabilities, testing of such promising capabilities in large-scale proof-of-concept demonstrations, working closely within the different branches of DHS and the Office of the Secretary to broker the necessary emotional commitment to the implementation of these particular capabilities. Namely, it is all about integration, integration at all levels and with all parties involved from end user, vendors, etc. It is this philosophy of system-level integration that is employed by our company, Markland Technologies, when we endeavor to produce integrated solutions for container inspection, border security, air transportation, and military force protection. No single company can solve these problems, and therefore industry consortiums must be will be fostered by TISWIG to produce solutions that incorporate substantive capabilities along the best-of-breed system <coughs> integration capabilities. 
A quick look around the industry will reveal that many disrupted technologies are hidden within small businesses and little-known research facilities, while much of the best-of-breed system integration capabilities are found within large Fortune 500 companies. Therefore, small companies must be brought together with large companies to create the necessary capabilities to reduce the terrorist threat. Neither function by itself will prove adequate to stay ahead of the terrorists or to properly counter their God-given ingenuities. In closing, I would like to provide one small example of our experiences with the successful research and development of border security and military force protection technology, this, this technology behind Markland's vehicle stopping system. For many years now, the San Ysidro border crossing, the busiest border port of land entry into the United States, has had to cope with attempts at illegal entry by port runners. Undeterred port runners provide illegal entry for immigrants, drugs, illicit materials, weapons, and possibly terrorists into the United States. The INS required a unique solution that would stop the cars but not cause fatalities to the occupants of the vehicle or border agents. Markland Technologies worked with the INS to create, install, and successfully, su successfully test the vehicle stopping system, the VSS. This net can capture a car at speeds in excess of 50 miles per hour with no harm whatsoever to the occupants of the vehicle or border agents. The VSS is now a prime example of a disruptive capability that can greatly help to counter potential terrorist threats to the border. Unfortunately, without a systems level implementation into all entry exit vehicle lanes, the VSS will sit in storage as a prime example of what happens when you do not bring together all the components of the roadmap to success. We at Markland Technologies look forward to contributing to the future success of TISWIG and the DHS by working collaboratively to develop the best technology solutions for decreasing the terrorist threats currently facing the United States. Thank you very much. Mr. Borey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and Mr. Tierney, uh, my name is Lawrence Borey with HDR. We're a national architect engineering firm. We have 80 offices and 3,500 employees around the country, uh, one in White Plains, close to your district, and one in Boston. Uh, we also have a wholly owned subsidiary called HDR Security Operations, which is headquartered in Orlando, Florida. My testimony today will be related to facility security rather than individual technologies. We have had many years of experience with many federal agencies, both military and domestic. Uh, we are the principal architects for the renovation of the Pentagon and many of the technologies developed over previous years by other firms are being incorporated into the improved security of that important building. Our experience is that planning, vulnerability assessments, policies, and training are often more critical than hardware procurement for facilities security. And too often, first responders, local governments, state governments jump into hardware procurement for security without doing the necessary vulnerability assessments and planning. We believe that DHS needs a strong central procurement directorate and are concerned that the procurement directorate uh, to date seems to be a subset of the management uh, undersecretary. We don't think it's been given enough visibility. Our experience with DHS constituent agencies has been favorable, however, and we look forward to continuing to provide services for architect engineering to the newly created Bureau of Immigration and Customs Enforcement, which combined three agencies before that. The existing procurement processes, however, uh, of the constituent agency should not be interrupted while the DHS develops its own acquisition regulations. And we also urge that DHS acquisition regulations incorporate the Brooks Act, which is FAR Part 36 for architect engineering services, which was the, champ the champion for which was Chairman Brooks, whose uh, portrait is on the, the wall there. We are concerned about the inadequate competition for many new initiatives in DHS, and our experience is that some security initiatives have been sole sourced through the GSA supply schedule. Complex analysis, such as vulnerability assessments, are too important and too numerous in terms of the number of critical infrastructure components to, be, to rely on the capacity and capability of a single firm. One particular example that I'll note was the procurement for port security vulnerability assessments. There are 50 major ports and, and many uh, hundreds of minor ports in the United States. The Congress very specifically said that 
that uh, the Coast Guard should do a vulnerability assessment on major ports. In order to get up, get going quickly, Coast Guard chose a single contractor off the supply schedule. It is our information uh, at the latest that, that the, um, the contract is behind schedule for meeting the vulnerability assessments of all those 50 ports. We've also submitted a preliminary proposal for a national backup 911 system to the Office of Homeland Security. We received little encouragement from OHS, so we have not further developed it. I would be pleased to answer any questions, and I'm happy to uh, submit this testimony. Thank you. Um, I, thank you for all your patience, because this is a large panel. Um, I'm going to first go to Mr. Tierney, and he'll ask some questions, and then I have a number of questions I want to ask. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. I want to thank all of you. This has been an informative uh, panel and, and very helpful. I note the heavy Massachusetts influence, and despite the fact that there's one gentleman from Connecticut, I, I say that I'm, I'm proud that you know, so many of the uh, innovative ideas that are coming out are coming out with some connection to Massachusetts or from Massachusetts. We have some wonderful businesses there, small We eat off with the crumbs off your table, Yes, sir. you do, sir. <laughs> you get the, uh, but you're eating well these days, so don't. Uh, I had a few ideas of things I wanted to explore uh, if we had the time. One is all of you, I assume, that are in a business developing something, a patent or, some other, or somehow otherwise protect the end product. Would that be a fair assumption? I was interested in Mr. Sword's statement that uh, you want to make it open licensing so that others may still take availability, and you're firmly in favor of that from your comments, is that something that you think we should require of all contracts uh, done with government money or is something peculiar to what you're doing? I want to make sure I'm not, uh, not misunderstood, sir. Um, or misquoted. <laughs> <laughs> uh, TISWIG is defining a common architecture by which all competitors, robotic platforms and tools will interoperate. Okay. Uh, this does not mean that we're willing to give away our IP and allow other people to produce the, the intellectual property that we've developed in-house. Uh, okay. But we are on board with their attempt at defining the future of robotics such that multiple vendors can provide equipment that will play well together. Right. Well, fair enough. Then let me ask anybody who wants to answer that. But the gentleman would just to spend just a sec. Could you move your robotic creature right in front of us so we can see this? Just, uh, you hit him probably. Yeah. Keep coming, keep coming. Stop right there. That's perfect. That's perfect. Thank you. <coughs> That's not armed, is it? <laughs> yes, it has an arm. Now tell us what this, this thing does. I'm sorry. This, this vehicle is configured as an explosive ordnance disposal robotic tool. Uh, the arm you see on it uh, has an 80 inch reach. Uh, it has a 300 power zoom camera with illumination on the end of it. At the uh, second joint, you'll see that there's a gripper. Uh, the lift capability on this arm is uh, 15 pounds working in the near vicinity and uh, 5 pounds at full extension. Uh, it was designed under contract with the UK Ministry of Defense uh, as, as a solution to one of their high-tech next generation tools. This is a good example of uh, requirements-driven design. It is as tall as it is. Why? Because it needs to be able to look into the upper bins of an aircraft. Um, it also has uh, several preset poses on it that assist the operator. This is uh, what I cited as an example of the next generation. It, does, it, it takes some of the burden off of the operator for EOD because they're not, no longer controlling joint by joint control on an arm, but the arm is going to preset poses and it uh, does what we call resolved motion so they can actually fly the gripper or fly the camera and the joints will respond appropriately and they don't have to understand what each joint angle is going to be. The technology has finally caught up with science fiction and it allows us to offload the operator to be able to more effectively accomplish the job. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Tierney. Thank you. And uh, do you get paid to play with that? Do you get paid to play with this? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you do. I'm sure you do. But well, my question then for those of you who want to answer this is what, if anything, is the appropriate thing for the funding entity, the government, to then ask back from the companies that receive that funding when they have a successful commercial product? 
I'd like to answer that, sir. Um, in this case, uh, the Tiswick funding is letting us take this particular technology from an integrated payload that only functions on our chassis and wrap the Tiswick common architecture around it so that it can be provided to the other vendors and can be purchased by bomb squads to use on existing chassis if they already have. That way I'm not forcing them to buy a complete system from me, but tis through Tiswick funding I create this common architecture interface on this arm and then make it available to my competitors to augment the existing equipment that the bomb squads have already invested dollars into. Anybody else care to answer that? Yes, Mr. Sawicki. A good example of, of how um, this process works, I think, was in the development of these clothing systems. When we had the first award from Tiswig, there was no standard in place for first responder protective clothing on, uh, for these particular end users. And through the research that was done through TISWIG and funding that was provided by our corporation and other, and other firms, you know, we were able to provide the National Fire Protection Association in Boston um, a template of the testing that would be required to establish a national standard for these kinds of uh, pieces of equipment. So uh, we would not be um, very happy to give up intellectual property um, to anybody else. We felt that the um, the synergism that came from the government and various agencies within the government and various private companies working together allowed us to have a national standard that's now in place that, as he said, is sort of a common architecture for everybody to do procurements to. I think that's very useful. Mr. DeGrasse, if you want uh, Yes. Now, typically, the government shares with the developer uh, the intellectual property of something that is developed under a government contract, but the government cannot itself then do anything with that property, can't give it to a third party for a certain number of years. So there is a system like that in place uh, as we speak. Uh, if the gentleman would just spend a second. The, what good does it do to, to have the property rights if you can't use them? In other words, it doesn't make sense to me. Well, the government does get an opportunity to use it. It just does not get an opportunity to use it right away and set up a third party in com competition with the original developer. You know, it, it can do it after a period of time, after the original developer has had an opportunity to, to, to use it himself. Yeah, and, if, and I think somebody mentioned on the earlier panel that should you go out of business or something of that nature, the government has retained the rights to then proceed. Yes. <coughs> Thank you. There's one other aspect of this uh, that needs to be taken into account. Sometimes the technology we develop needs to be uh, secure so that it can't be misused either in another facility uh, where it wouldn't function as well or by uh, a, a way of disarming the technology and particularly entrance security or physical security. Uh, we designed the standards for the uh, U.S. Bureau of Prisons uh, to develop uh, federal prisons and these were, these were modular systems that, were, that could be used in a variety of places. Um, obviously they're used in different temperatures, different humidities, so there were ranges of, of usability that had to be developed into them. And of course, we also didn't want them to, the technology to get out so that they couldn't be used for people to enter or get out without proper permission. Rightfully so. Okay. Mr. Sawicki, you talked about some barriers to that. And one uh, thing that you mentioned was that the, there were people, I thought you said, there were people that were purchasing your product, end users, or products competitive products that weren't up to the standard of your product and you thought that that should be corrected in some way that we're not now doing it. Would yes, sir. You, would you expand on that a little bit for me? Um, yes. I think when the Congress has appropriated funds, um, there's been guidance given to the states as they uh, go buy equipment. They say you should meet national standards with your clothing. Let's just look, for example, at, at a suit like that. The critical interfaces of a suit are around the mask and at the cuffs and the closures. And if you go out right now to one of your departments up there and you see somebody with duct tape stuck on in different places, what they're attempting to do is bridge the gap or interfaces between these pieces of equipment. Now, if you were to go in with a uh, sprayer and the um, National Fire Protection Association test specifies a spray test, um, none of those duct tape gaps will pass, reliably pass a, a spray test. Whereas these um, systems, since they were designed together as a system, will. And you, you can see if you're out in the field, if someone sprays some noxious toxic chemical and you don't want it dripping down your chin down where you can see where it ends up, or in your cuff in the same way uh, if you have to grab somebody. So communities are choosing to, to buy something that's substandard? Well, I think they're not educated as to the standard right now. And because the, um, 
because the uh, the funding is is sort of broad, you know, just go buy what you want, basically. Um, you're, people, excuse me, you're telling me that our funding is so broad. I mean, I've seen some of these things that they don't seem as broad, but I'd like to know if they are. The funding might say, here's some federal money, go buy a product. We don't say go buy a product that is up to such and such standards or better. Well, when I sat on the interagency board, we were trying to transition to the next level once a standard was in place to require people to buy to a standard. And um, that's happened over the last couple of years. And I think as, I, I just urge you, as the funding catches up in the next cycle, sure um, follow the interagency board's recommendations, which to, are, are to purchase two recognized standards. Okay. You also mentioned, Mr. Swicky, where I have you, um, that you had a project going, you had the picture up there for the burn uh, situation. Yes, sir. And, and that was serving a, a particular need that had been identified to you that was, I assume, fairly pressing if it made it all the way through the process to getting funded. But then you said it was stopped for lack of funding. Yes, sir. What happened? We went through a one-year um, one th year development phase in which we met all our milestones, and we believe we had a design that um, would have met all the requirements. Um, it just wasn't funded uh, past that, and so we don't have the capability in this country right now, in my opinion, to respond to any kind of an agricultural outbreak. Was without. there any communication to you as to why that wasn't funded, why they didn't choose to move forward on it? Was there a competitor coming up with an alternative? Was there uh, no, sir. Um, Tiswig actually worked very aggressively with us trying to secure additional funding to try to get a prototype made. Uh, we actually went even up to Canada trying to get some money from Canada. Uh, and I have to commend the Tiswick people especially for really working with us on that. My um, understanding was there just wasn't a sufficient uh, uh, budget. Um, well, I, I guess, interrupting you, I'm sorry, but, but Mr. Chairman, it would seem to me that Tiswick would be the one to make the decision what the priorities were. It goes back to my question of the earlier panel. If you've made a decision that this is a priority, why do you stop? I mean, obviously, there are other things being done, and if this is in the pipeline, you don't stop. You, you get it done unless the price is so far out of control that it, it just doesn't doesn't strike a balance there and no longer can meet that criteria. I, uh, we'll have to look into that. I'm just uh, struck yes, by that. Do you want to cut in here something? Yes, I would love to. Go ahead, yeah. uh, I, I'm trying to nail down a few things, and, and Mr. Tenney was getting to it, so uh, I was happy he was asking these questions. I, I want to understand, first off, should I view you as um, as scientists creating a product or as entrepreneurs developing a product? Uh, how do you each view yourself? And let's go down, Dr. Patel, maybe both. I consider, I consider both okay. scientist and entrepreneur. Okay, I'm gonna come right back to you. I'd answer yes to both of those. I believe that's the correct statement, both. I'd say ditto. And I would say that our members are uh, from both areas and consider themselves both. Okay. Entrepreneurial. Okay. We are both. We have scientists, engineers, technicians. Right. But, but among yourself, are you just, I, I, I'm just trying to understand. Personally, I represent the company, so I am neither a scientist okay. nor an entrepreneur. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, when you develop an idea, uh, my first reaction would be there's a market for this idea, so why do I need the government? I can develop this product, I don't have, uh, uh, and I can make money off of it because there is a market. Am I assuming there isn't a market, uh, or do I assume that you are so small that you don't have the capabilities? Walk me through why you need the government, and I just as soon go right up the line here. Um, in fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go every other one so we don't have to keep passing the mic while we're waiting. So I'll go to you. Yes, Mr. P I Dr. I think when, when we get good ideas, the risk of developing an entirely new product is so high that small companies cannot afford it. Okay. So we Mr. often go to government. Now, I guess if, if you, I see you all nodding your head, if you have something that you would just add to it, Mr. Sword. As I mentioned in my statement, Mr. Chairman, the uh, target market really doesn't support large investments in revolutionary technologies. So it is the infusion of the money from the U.S. government that helps make the breakthroughs occur. The, the market itself just isn't going to allow me to sell enough of these robots to ever pay for the research and development. In your to case, get to this I can level. see that. But, but, but can't you price it in a way that gives you a return? Um, or even then, it's still not going to? We, we are attacking other markets that, that offer more lucrative return on the investment, and the technologies can cross those boundaries, but to specifically develop a tool to dispose of bombs 
is such a small market <coughs> that, that I don't think the technologies would ever exist without some push. Okay. Mr. Well, yeah. our organization has a number of members that uh, are very large. They are in the billion plus uh, dollar range. And those have no problems developing their technology and getting it ready for the marketplace. They have very large R&D uh, departments. But when you get down to the midsize and the small companies that make up uh, a, a, a large percentage of our group, they simply cannot uh, afford to put in uh, all of the uh, all of the funds necessary to develop, you know, not even something as sophisticated as this, but something perhaps a little less sophisticated, and yet the need is still there, and that's why they look to the government. The federal government is just one of a number of clients that we have um, to upgrade security operations. If you'll notice from page four of our written statement, we also provide these services to healthcare facilities, to universities, museums, uh, and private enterprise, including but, but the you, railroads. But you didn't really speak to the government funding technology. You were speaking about government contracting, which is, which is do, you, do you have an, uh, do you want to share anything as it relates to technology, as it relates to your area? Well, we do have, we do have some areas that um, the government funds some of the technology that we use in installing the, the security systems in the facilities. But, but generally, that's not our business. Mr. Sawicki? I'd like to give you an example. Maybe that's an unfair thing to do, but from my past life, I used to work at Arthur D. Little in Cambridge doing technology development. And at one time, there was a government contract um, area that was very aggressive looking at nuclear flash protection. In other words, a magic sunglass that would stop a nuclear right. flash. And we went out to look to optics people. Let me understand why, why that's necessary. In other words, someone could be blinded or? Yes, sir. Okay. In other words, a nuclear flash would be so bright and so fast that it would blind, particularly a pilot. They were particularly interested in okay. pilots. Okay. Um, we went out to optics manufacturers, um, and they said, well, and we'd really, uh, we're really better off from a market perspective developing sunglasses for surfers because we get a much higher return on investment. There really aren't that many nuclear flash requirement sunglasses <laughs> out there. Okay. Um, and we're just not interested in working with you. Now, we went even, even trying to fund these people with some seed money to get going. And there still was very little uh, interest in going after that. So we had to go back and find small specialty companies, provide funding, directed funding. And you're, I think you see the same thing in all these areas, that even if the... Um, market seems very clear to those of us in the business that is there. When we go to one of our investors, our board, and they come in and say, okay, what are you going to invest in this year? And I said, well, our return on investment three years out is going to be a 7% yield, but we could open a, a fast food restaurant here in Germantown, Maryland, which is rapidly growing and make 30% a year. They're going to tell us to get into the restaurant business. So the technology business is just different from okay. others. Thank you. <coughs> yes, I, I think I pretty much echo what everybody else has said. The, uh, for us, we look at two markets. Uh, one is obviously if there's a return on the investment, and we look at, at markets and determine whether or not a product that we, we develop with our own money will have a reasonable return. Uh, but very often, we're also problem solvers. In the case of our Z backscatter van, we've been asked by the Army to come up with a variant on that technology that they can deploy in Iraq. Now, we don't normally have to develop technology that can handle 135 degrees Fahrenheit temperatures during the day, uh, withstand uh, dust storms, fit onto C-130 aircraft, be operated remotely from up to, uh, you know, one and a half kilometers away. These kinds of things, we look to the government because the return on that investment for developing that kind of capability is just not there. And, and we really think that's, um, if we can use some of the government money to support that part of it, then we, we have a good good marriage of, of good products. Thank you. Mr. Right. And it's, it's all about who the customer is. I mean, in, in most of our products, they do have commercial applications, but those commercial applications are multiple years out. In the meantime, a lot of things have to be funded to create those applications, and typically the government is the first customer for a lot of these uh, new technologies. Just going back to your example with the housewife, for example, if she does have a solution to a problem that she's aware of. I said homemaker. I'm sorry, homemaker. Uh, if, she, if she is a homemaker and she has a technology that she believes can solve a problem, I doubt in most cases that she would have the resources to take that product, develop it into a prototype, test it, et cetera, et cetera, to get it through. That's where the government can really come in and help. And we, we do a lot of business with a lot of 
end users at the borders of the country, et cetera, that also have these amazing ideas, but they have to have a facility in order to get them prototypes developed, et cetera, et cetera. I have a confession at this hearing. I said, homemaker, the first time I used that story, I said housewife, and I was I, there too. I, I was corrected quickly, <laughs> um, and rightfully so. Um, Mr. Patel, Dr. Patel, I'm sorry. Um, you, your, um, your, your cards that, um, that you developed, uh, tell me first who the market was for these. I'm sorry, can who, you? Who is the market for these? Who is the potential buyer? At the this user? stage, there is no buyer other than the first responder or the government. Yeah, but, the, but, but the government in many places, this, this would potentially be um, uh, folks uh, at customs? Yes, yes, it would be mainly the first responder, police, firefighters, who, in case okay. of dirty bomb explosion, they, they have to respond first. And so, so that, I'm sorry, that would be local, potentially state and federal. It's, a pretty, it's local, a pretty nice market. Correct. Right. How do, um, and let me be clear, is this, uh, have, the, you develop this with funding. How much funding did you receive? First, it was funded by Navy. They will see system right. come out with SBIR phase one and two, which is about three quarter of a million dollar. Of a million, you're right. Yes, and then there was some problem. It was developing darker color at lower temperature and lighter color at higher temperature. If, if somebody so you had to is, keep perfecting it. That's right. And, you, and that this week funded it, so we we saw, we solved some of those problems. Is, is is this ready to go in operation or? It's it's almost ready to in that format. Yes, it is ready to go right. in operation. Okay. And, and in the process of doing research, um, the government is assessing its value to yes, it? Yes, uh, yeah. that, that's what we are, you know, Navy is evaluating, so does this week. Right. But I mean, in other words, at one point you're developing the, project, the product. The next thing, though, the government is trying to see um, if it meets its standards. Is that, and this was, not, this was not done at the request of the federal government. Uh, you did it, you, you basically came to the government. No, I, that originally proposal was solicited by Navy that they were looking for an instant okay. type of dosimeter in case of nuclear explosion. Okay. And then Tiswick saw that this could be used by first responder in case of dirty bomb. Right. Either Navy, Navy and our government must have foreseen that, that there could be such a need. So the Navy had solicited the proposal. Well, and the, but the government hasn't bought this yet. They've just helped you fund it. Uh, Tizwick has bought 6,000 of them. Okay. How do you decide ultimately, uh, this seems a little bit on this aside, but it is related. How do the government decide what, it, what they're going to pay you? And how do you decide whether you're willing to sell? And by the way, can you refuse to sell afterwards? Can the no, government, I, I, let, me hear, let me state all the questions I have. Can sure. the government set the price? First, can you set the price? Can the government set the price? Uh, and can you f refuse to sell this product once the government helped you develop it? First thing, I would not refuse it. Price or uh, would not matter because it's when the nation needs, sir. It's it, my pleasure to provide this, the no, you, product. You, no, you're not going to do it for nothing. No, of course, I, I would not do for nothing. I'm in business and would like to make profit, but still, so, if it is government needs it or citizens maybe need Maybe I'm it. doing something too hypothetical for you. Maybe I'm suggesting something where you don't think it, that would happen. You think you will arrive at a price, but maybe one of you could tell me how the government sets the price in this, Mr. Sword. Uh, I mean, Mr. Mr. Minardi, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, for our equipment, which is pretty much capital equipment, very often the price is set for the government based on our cost. Government has the right to come in and audit our books and find out how much a product costs, and then we're able to put a, a modest fee on that, and that, that establishes the price. And we have to use that as, as the lowest price uh, is always sold to the U.S. government, and any other commercial price has to be somewhat higher than that anywhere in the world. So that's one way the price can be established if you have not established a commercial price for it. And, uh, but typically, if it's developed by the government, that's the way the price is, is developed. Now, I don't know if it was in response, Ms. Turney, to, um, Mr. Sword responding to your question, or it was someone else where you were talking about, a, about purchasing a product that didn't work. Who was? Who was? Mr. Swicky. Swicky, yeah, thank you. The, when I was at Los, when the committee had, uh, went to Los Alamos at the lab there, uh, they were showing us um, detection equipment that they said was being sold to the government, um, and no one had ever consulted with them 
as to how effective it was. And they showed us different products. And some worked better than others, and some didn't work well at all. And yet the government was purchasing some of this, um, which was kind of intriguing to me. Uh, I, were you suggesting that the government is buying certain products that just simply don't work? Yes. Okay. I'd say they work less effectively than others. Um, and, it depends and that, if you have nothing. I'm sorry, sir. Yeah. In other words, if they had done more research, they would have found there was a better product. It just didn't get their attention. Yes. So, what what this triggers in my mind is, if if um, if Tiswick is basically helping you do the research, is it also become a stamp of a house for good keeping stamp of approval? Is it does it become something that you got kind of go to whomever you're selling and saying this has gone through this process and they like it and whatever? Yes, that's a very effective uh, marketing tool. Anybody else want to respond to that? Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, under TISWIG, it's uh, as uh, my colleague uh, next to me has said, under TISWIG, you have, uh, uh, you set a cost, and then they, TISWIG, and, and you determine what the price is going to be based on the cost. But with regard to SBIR, uh, there is an upper limit for each phase of development. And so those programs are entirely different as to how they fund uh, and set a price for a product. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, just out of curiosity, I'd like to know what an experience was. Have any of our witnesses actually submitted a proposal that was not solicited? You have. Would you tell me what the experience was on that in terms of how you were treated and how it was dealt with as opposed to those that were solicited? Well, I mentioned to you that uh, one of the things we did as a result of 9-11 was uh, develop with a software uh, company a concept, a preliminary proposal for a national 911 uh, 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 backup system, which would be located initially in one part of the country. We were considering Offutt Air Force Base as, a, as one potential place, be mainly because of the connection for, by fiber optics there throughout the country. And we brought it to the Office of Homeland Security. As a matter of fact, HSIA helped us do that. And we're still in a preliminary proposal phase, and we gave them an idea of how it would work. And, um, and basically, they said, that's nice. We're not, we're not able to respond to that right now. And we've never heard anything back from them on it. Um, so they don't know if it's dead or just in limbo? Yeah, we have not gone any further to, to develop the proposal further. Thank you. Mr. Mastronati, you, uh, you talked about spreading the opportunity. You, I think you mentioned that you thought there were too many uh, large projects being funded and not enough smaller funding. Is that a fair restatement of what you said? Yes. What uh, leads you to that conclusion, and what do you think ought to be done about it, or how could they do something about that? Well, I, I think that um, we may not have all the facts to back that up, but it appears that the money's you know, at least initially, was spread around a lot to try a number of ideas. You know, in, in order to really have an impact on some of the mission objectives from the <coughs> Department of Defense, you really need to focus and execute well throughout the process, and that requires a fair amount of money. Very often, we find that if we come in with a uh, proposed solution that requires a fair amount of money in the millions of dollars, that it, it doesn't get funded. And I guess that's been our experience, that if you come in with something less than a million dollars, your chances go up dramatically. Regardless of what the apparent need is for the thing. Uh, I mean, again, I think this would be another area if we had some priorities, maybe that would help us to decide whether or not we had to spend more than a million because it was just sure. that important versus and, and that's fair. something else. And I guess it goes back to that. Um, there was also some mention of a couple of people. Mr. Grass here, I think you mentioned it, as well as Mr. Mastanati, and I'm not sure who else. Uh, about sole sourcing uh, on that. And I was a little amused because, Mr. Wick, I think you mentioned you had five uh, contracts on that. I was watching to see if there was a reaction from you for the aspect of sending to say that they're going back to the same people all the time or not. Does somebody want to talk about that? Maybe you want to respond to that a little, Mr. Wick, Mr. DeGrasse, you want to tell me what we do about that or, or how it is you come to the conclusion that you think that's a problem? I think it's the larger contracts that tend to be sole source. The small ones seem to be spread out, as you said, among a lot of different firms. But occasionally you'll see something in the in the newspaper you've never even heard about, or you never had a chance to bid on, where you know so and so got the 
$500 million contract to do a nationwide integration of something, you say, you know, we didn't even see that. You couldn't even get on the team. And I think that that's happened quite a bit since 9-11 in, in, in a lot of different agencies. Um, whatever process has been used to do that selection, I'm not sure, but it is frustrating. That, that was a huge issue of contention in this committee when we were dealing with the establishment of the Homeland Security Department. And there were many of us, and I, and I think the chairman might have even joined us on that one, who thought that that was not a good process to go. There's a provision for that in Department of Defense contracts. Many of us thought that that was not the way to go uh, to any excessive degree in this, and we think that the language did open it up too much. I would assume that we're going to revisit that uh, in future iterations of the legislation, but it was a very conscious thing that was done. There was a large debate about it. There was a wide chasm disagreement amongst people on that, so you're hitting right on what I thought you were talking about at any rate. Uh, let me just ask um, one last question, and then, um, Mr. Chairman, I have to go if you're going to sure. stick around on that. But, uh, Mr. Grazi, you talked about the, the need for forums, uh, maybe with the Small Business Administration's uh, participation and others to educate uh, your industry out there on that. Uh, are there any efforts like that going on now that you're aware of? Have you had contacts with the SBA to, to start uh, initial discussions on how that might be done, or is that just an idea that you, you broached today? It's an idea that our members have come up with. Uh, now, the, the industry days that, the, uh, uh, that has been, have been done uh, by the Homeland Security Department are tremendously successful in educating uh, uh, industry about what has, uh, what's out there. But too many of the uh, technologies and too many of the technology companies, particularly the small and mid-sized ones, simply do not know what is out there and do not know what is available. Uh, and what, we, what our members are saying to us is we need some sort of a forum where we can find out more about uh, what we can do. As I mentioned uh, in my testimony, uh, we threw out the name of Tiswig to a number of our members and got a very small response. The chairman was afraid to even say it. It's yeah. true. It was. <laughs> do you have a lot of more questions? No, not a lot more. I can finish in five minutes. Uh, I'm going to have to excuse myself. I want to thank everybody very much. I know that some of you are coming over to my office later, and uh, Mr. McDermott behind me would be happy to accompany you over there. Thank you all very, very much. I appreciate your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to just go for five minutes. I would like to uh, just note for the record that um, Mr. McCallum has uh, stayed to hear what you all are saying, and I appreciate that very much. It's, uh, uh, And I think that... Uh, um, we have other representatives from the first panel, so we do thank them. Um, I'm, I'm getting a sense that Tiswig is kind of like the small businessman's uh, place to go to get support. And if you're big league, you don't go to DARPA and kind of go elsewhere. Um, I don't know if that's an accurate way to think of it, but. Um, you, you, you all have kind of mentioned defense, and I get a little nervous because I don't want the, the Defense Department uh, to rule. I, 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 in, in this issue, we're talking about Department of Homeland Security. And, and um, I, I would love to know um, whether you uh, intend to come back uh, to Tiswick and, uh, in future projects and whether you intend to come back on anything you've thought about that simply, Mr. Borey has been mentioned, uh, he went on his own accord on a proposal he had, but um, you all seem to have responded to proposal rather than to have thought of one yourself and said, we want to move forward. So I, I'd love to have a response to that. Are you, are you planning to go back with other items, or is it only going to, are you, do you think it's going to be a waste of time if you go on something that hasn't been solicited, and so on? My personal experience is very professional. I'm dealing with very professional people, and if... Very we, what people? Very professional. Yes, professional. And uh, uh, if, if, I, if there is a proposal or concept I have which can be funded by TISWIC, I would definitely would okay. submit a proposal. And you would go there first before going to the department that might have a, the direct focus on that? Uh, innovation? Uh, I have to use my judgment. If it, there is direct focus and, uh, you know, it, it could be funded by other agency, I, I would consider both uh, and then uh, have to select one. Well, is, in other words, is Tiswick going to be your first place to go or your second place? And, that's, and that doesn't mean something bad to the, about them. It just means that you, you may feel that you have a more specific issue that, that 
you can get a better response. In other words, would you rather, let me in put it this way. I'm going to ask it this way. Would you rather go to Tiswick first to be turned down or go to the department first to be turned down? Uh, which one do you go to first and why? That's really what I'm asking. If it is related to Homeland Security or so, I would go to Tiswick first. So Homeland Security, you go to Tiswick first. That's how you've kind of sorted that. Yes, sir. I'd go to the Department of Homeland. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I'd, go on. I'd go to the Department of Homeland Security first, only because the only way Tiswick works is if we find the need first. So if we can find a if solution. If you find a what? Slow down. The need. Yeah. The need first. There right? has to be a, much like uh, on the first panel they said, there's a lot of technologies out there. A lot of them are really cool, but a lot of them don't solve a single problem. Where we have found the best luck is if we can talk with either end users or people within the Department of Homeland Security who actually have a specific problem that we can then match up to a technology, whether still in development or, or seen in its fruition, then go backwards and then we can try to figure out how to get the funding for it. At that point in time, we would go to Tiswig. But you almost describe, it almost is like you, you have a resume for a job, you want to speak to someone, you just don't want them to see your document. Uh, you want to talk to someone, a real person. Maybe I'm reading something more into it. Yeah, in other words, are you saying you're doing your homework with someone else before you go to Tiswick because you only got one shot there and it's a piece of paper and you want to make sure you've kind of set the groundwork? Exactly. Th that's one. And the other is any technology can be used in multiple areas. So if we can find a real need out there for this technology and then work backwards, it's just much, much more effective. So you think Tiswick has a broader view? Yes, if anything, I think they have too broad a view. If, if that's where, if we talk to the Department of Homeland Security and they have a very narrow view on exactly what's needed, and then we can take a technology and match that up, then we can go back to Tiswick with that. Okay, let me just, just pursue this a little more. In the process of going to Homeland Security, you feel kind of like you're lobbying first before someone who ultimately is going to, and that's nothing wrong with that, but I'm just trying to see how you work within the system. I'm not sure. Let me just finish the question. Are you basically saying that you would go to Homeland Security, get to talk to someone who's a real live person, then you'd go to Tiswick, have a better idea, it has a broader approach, maybe someone will identify you somewhere else, but you have a person in the room that already knows a little bit about what, what this is about? Is that part of your, your approach? Exactly. I, I just don't know, not that it has never happened or couldn't happen, but I'm not sure just alone a small company such as ours going to Tiswick would get much uh, exposure or, or recognition, attention. Uh, but if we went to Tiswig as a small company such as ours and also had some sort of advocate or sponsor within the Department of Homeland Security, that's where it would work the best. I, I saw a few nodding their heads here. Do you want to speak to that? Yeah, I think, that, I think that's, that's accurate. If you have a, um, a client within the government who has a specific need and, and you have an idea to fulfill that need, if you had to work it through TISWIG, it would have to get into a requirement that got into a broad agency announcement or even somehow uh, supported as an unsolicited proposal. But if you're going in through a broad agency announcement, you're going up against 12,000 other people with, with one sheet of paper. And sometimes it's, it's much more expeditious to go directly to the people who need the technology the most and, and can really define exactly what they need. And, uh, you know, that would be the first preference because if you're a problem solver, that's, that's the quickest way to uh, have a path to solution. But, but I do believe that uh, TISWIG also serves a purpose of trying to collate the general uh, requirements and needs of the federal government and putting them into uh, categories that people can respond to to get a broader, um, you know, technology base for Homeland Security. What we're trying to do at part in this hearing is make sure that the significant number of ideas that are being presented don't get lost. And kind of what I'm hearing is, though, you still need an advocate, or you feel a little more comfortable if you have an advocate within Tiswick. So as much as on paper you've got this one piece of paper, uh, you, you feel a little better if you've got someone who says, don't, don't, don't overlook this, this, this proposal here. I think that's accurate. With you know, with 12,000 or so respondents to a broad agency announcement, it's it's really a, a pretty daunting problem to sift through all those and say, okay, based on one sheet of paper, this is the technology of choice to fund, and either it needs a, uh, an advocate that says this is exactly what we need, or there needs to be, as someone suggested, a couple other pages attached to this that if it sounds even close to being of interest, then there's a little more to read initially before it gets. But but if I now do the inverse. 
what that suggests to me is if someone doesn't do that, uh, we may be losing some really good proposals because uh, what you seem to be suggesting, and it seems logical to me, one page is a pretty difficult way to present your case. Um, and uh, you may lose it, and it may be a great idea. Any other comments on this? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, one of the issues, the general issues that our members have is with the uh, whole unsolicited proposal process uh, itself. It's not generally well understood. and. Uh, I can attest from the other side as well because I used to use I uh, used to work for the Defense Department, and we would get unsolicited proposals through all sorts of channels, and it was very clear that the people who were submitted them didn't have any idea of how the process worked. And talking to my members in my current role, they don't, you know, some of them do, of course, but not a lot of them uh, uh, know what's going to happen to an unsolicited proposal when it gets somewhere or if it gets somewhere. Okay. Let's do this. Uh, let's finish up here. Is there any? Uh, closing comment that any of you uh, would like to make? Uh, anything you think needs to be put on the record? Just, what you, just to add on to what you just said is I believe that there needs to be different, um, there's no way impossible, I don't think that Tiswick could ever have the resources to judge all these different proposals. And that's where I think what we're really asking you to do is reach out into other areas, whether it be private industry, whether they, they be the end users or industry experts to try to really help them go through that filtering process that you're talking about, whether the ideas are solicited or unsolicited. You know, it would be interesting if, if they, uh, they had a process to do this, and then they had, um, and then they had another uh, group that could take a second look. Uh, and maybe, um, maybe this is even something that a GAO report could do, to see if we're losing some good ideas uh, and have another panel of experts look at it and say, you know what? You should have tried this and then brought that, that in individuals or, uh, individual or individuals forward to make their proposal and see if we're missing some, some good ideas. That's, that would be interesting. Thank you for that right. suggestion. Any other point? Yes, sir. Mr. Sowich. Um, I'd like to echo the comment before about there's a certain cost range that TISWIC seems to be comfortable in funding and typically under a million dollars for, for a effort. And that's okay? I think that's okay, but um, a lot of times we'll I won't say dumb down, that's a wrong thing. We'll condense the scope of a proposal to try to get it under a million dollars for perhaps a technology that really will cost a lot more. And I'll just throw one out on the table because it's an extraordinarily difficult one, which is biodetection and analysis. Um, it's really hard. Everybody wants a you know, $50 card like the radiation one that will tell you 20 different biological agents. You think it's going to cost $50? No, it's under $10. Okay. That one is $10, but the, the one they always use for bio is 50 I, th I think you're asking too much. <laughs> if I was negotiating with you, I'd say five. It's a great idea, but you're going to sell a lot of these. I'm sorry. But the, um, some of these things are extraordinarily difficult, uh, some of these technology uh, challenges. And a lot of times you'll come in and, and try to narrow your scope to just look at something so you can get into a range that Tiswick would want to fund. Um, and you'll get a comment back saying, well, you didn't address all the issues or, or something like that. And it's really difficult sometimes to try to do that within that budget range. So I think it almost would be a um, part of the Department of Homeland Security or some other agency, a way that would fit into the TISWIC process so they can say, well, you know, that's really not within our scope. It ought to go to somewhere else. So I think the debrief process and some direction back to especially small companies that was mentioned earlier would be very useful. I, I agree with that, and I'll just say, to, uh, I'll just repeat what you're saying. I think that it would be very helpful to have a debriefing. We've done that with some constituents who have applied for federal grants and they haven't gotten it and they've wanted to know why and going through that process has really helped them the next time around. Any other comment or should we call it a close here? Yes. Trying not to drag it out, Mr. Chairman, but if I could uh, make the comment that I think TISWIG does, at least in the field that I address in bomb disposal, surround themselves with experts that understand what the end users need. I think this is very key when they're trying to make their different um, decisions on which technologies to fund and not to fund. The people I work directly with are really contract workers supporting um, TISWIG, but these guys have survived 23 years of disarming bombs, so they understand very well what the end user wants, would not like, would tolerate, would not tolerate. And I think that's uh, something to be said in their favor and that they, they do actively go after the talent that understands those fields well, and they are the interactions with the contractors that are helping guide the direction that the uh, technology is going to head. And I think that's a, a very positive thing that if uh, the Department of Homeland Security is going to to try to duplicate 
the process. They need to do similarly by surrounding themselves with the experts that understand what the end users need. Great. Thank you. Any other comment? Thank you all very, very much. Appreciate you. You've been an excellent panel. Thank you. Appreciate you coming to Washington to help us out. This hearing is now adjourned. I did not adjourn this hearing to just make the following. I just want to thank um, two people on the staff, if you don't mind recording that. Thank you. Uh, Joseph McGowan, who is a detailee from the Department of Labor, IG, and we thank him, and Mary Holloway, intern during the summer from Washington Lee Union, Union, University, came back, and we thank her as well, and I'd like that part of the record. Thanks for accommodating us. Thank you. This hearing is adjourned. The Do Not Call Registry to block telemarketing calls was just signed into law by President Bush. Today, the chairman of the Federal Trade Commission and FCC Chairman Michael Powell testify on Capitol Hill about the law's legal status and enforcement. Live coverage at 9.30 a.m. Eastern on C-SPAN 3.